Good evening, everyone. I would like to hereby call to order the Palm Springs regular city council meeting for January 13, 2022. Uh, our first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance, and I invite each of you to join me in standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mejia, could you do the roll call? Council Member Holstich. Here. Council Member Kors. Here. Council Member Woods. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Here. Mayor, Mayor Middleton. Present. All council members are present. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are, as a result of the pandemic, holding our first meeting in which absolutely everyone is uh, uh, joining us remotely. Uh, so we think we have this uh, under control, but please, uh, for those of you in the public, if uh, we have any technical difficulties, bear with us as we uh, work through them uh, during the course of this evening, and we hope that all of you are safe uh, this evening. With that, we have some presentations, and the first one is going to be a presentation to one of our wonderful employees who is coming upon retirement, and that is Kim Hardcastle. A and whereas Kim Hardcastle, a member of the Riverside County Treasurer and County Tax Collector's Office was first hired away by the city of Palm Springs as an accountant back in 1998, some 23 years ago. And whereas after 12 years in accounting in 2010, Kim transferred to serve as an analyst in the city's human resources department, moving up in the ranks to human resources manager in 2013. And on an interim basis, she acted as the city's acting human resources director from December 2020 to April 2021. And whereas Kim is certified in accounting for governmental and nonprofit organizations from the University of California, Riverside, receiving an MBA with specialization in human resources from National University. Whereas Kim has also been recognized as a certified professional in human resources from the City Society of Human Resources Management and certified as well as a professional in labor relations from the prestigious law firm of Libert, Cassidy and Whitmore. Whereas some of Kim's notable accomplishments at City Hall include assisting with the current and last round of labor negotiations, helping with the Y2K financial and payroll systems upgrades, organizing and participating in several MAPS community events, including the senior gift basket distribution, as well as serving on the holiday and employee of the year committees. Whereas from 20, 2005 through 2015, Kim also served as proud board member of the city of Palm Springs Federal Credit Union, helping them transition when they merged 10 years later to the Sun Community Federal Union, where she continued as a board member until 2019. And whereas Kim is well known at City Hall for her kindness and patience assisting city employees with a variety of human resources issues, always going the extra mile to answer questions and help her coworkers solve problems. And whereas everyone who has known Kim throughout her many years, serving the residents and employees of the city of Palm Springs will notice her absence. We wish her the very best in future endeavors as she goes forward. Therefore, be it resolved that we, the city of council of the city of Palm Springs, by the power vested in us to hereby thank and pay special tribute to Kim Hardcastle for 23 years of dedication and a job well done we wish her a happy, healthy, and exciting retirement. Kim, thank you so very much. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. 
Do you have anything you would like to say at this point? I would just like to say thank you um, for this honor. It has been a pleasure to work with the employees and their families, as well as uh, residents that I've come in contact with over the years. And I've, I'm happy to be starting this retirement chapter, but I'm very sad to be leaving my work family behind. Thank you for everything you have done and you have our very, very best wishes. Thank you. All right. Now we will move on to our second presentation, which is a COVID case, COVID-19 case and wastewater testing update. And that's going to come from uh, Don uh, Uyeno, our principal engineer. And Don, I apologize for butchering your last name. It's come from uh, Don uh, Uyeno, our principal engineer. And Don, I apologize for butchering your last name. It's come from uh, Don uh, Uh, do we have John? <clears throat> Here we go. Hello, um, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, here is our COVID update. Uh, right now you're looking at the Riverside County numbers. As you can see, um, it's going, the numbers are cases are going up. Um, our, Confirmed deaths in Riverside County continues to be low. Total testing in Riverside County seems like the light gray is the state averages. Riverside County seems to be below our state averages. And then positivity rate here in Riverside County, um, we are still going much higher than the state averages. Um, regarding hospitalizations, you, we can see that uptick. Um, and then our ICU beds are only at 62. Um, next slide. Um, our weekly numbers seems to be, here's our Delta variant, and then here's our Omicron variant. As you can see in the last several weeks, we've been just going up. Um, we've already surpassed in our highs that we saw in the Delta variant. As far as the cities here in the Coachella Valley, you can see every city, the four week trend is generally going up. Even Indian Wells, it's going up. Um, we've added 179 cases in the past week and zero deaths. Locally for our wastewater treatment testing, um, as you can see, this was the curve last winter. Um, our previous high was 2.6 million. As you can see in the last several weeks, we have just had numbers that are just skyrocketing. So in, in fact, in the last two days, uh, the Monday after New Year's, you can see our highest measure was 6.6 .6 million. Uh, the number did go down on the next day, uh, but we've seen that pattern before where the Monday number was higher than the Tuesday number. So we continue to watch these trends, but the overall trend is going up. Um, here's a look at the last 90 days. As you can see, we first detected Omicron's variant on December 7th. Um, in our wastewater samples. And as you can see, ever since we've detected that variant, the numbers have just continued to go up. Um, I wouldn't fixate exactly on the numbers, but just look at the trends. The trends are definitely going up. Um, so you can see this is where we were about a month ago. And here we are today, well over 6 million. This graph kind of shows a comparison of what happened last winter in red. So this was where we were at. Um, we hit a peak right between Christmas and New Year's, and then we started to go down. Um, you can see the data really correlated in October from last year and this year, but 
as you can see this year in blue, you know, we the numbers of measured copies of COVID um, it has been going up. And then this metric here, um, basically GT Molecular's model on what they would estimate how many cases would be in the population based off of the numbers that they've um, measured in our wastewater samples. Um, as you can see, the number is in the 25,000. Um, just a month ago, we were all the way down to 931. So again, don't fixate on the numbers, but just look at the trends. You see like trend analysis over time. So, you know, we were in the 1000 levels just at Thanksgiving and look at the kinds of numbers we've been having in the last couple of weeks. So that concludes my report. If there's any questions that you have, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, Council member Coors. Great, uh, thanks, Don. Um, and you know, the 25,000 number, and then it shows a, sorry, my screen went crazy there. Okay, 25,000 number, and then it shows you know a 50 plus percent. That's assuming that, right, all the people using wastewater, it seems, as they're doing it, and then they're using our full-time population, right? Yes. To get that number. And so some being on um, some calls with the county over the last uh, two weeks, one of the things, um, and the wastewater sort of shows this is, um, you know, off, often Mondays are higher because on the weekend we have, and it's not just more tourists, but they're obviously more tourists. We have all the people of vacation weekend houses here. We have a lot more workers here from other places in the Valley. So we know our population can double, um, you know, Christmas, New Year's, if not more. So just for folks to keep that in mind, but as the wastewater shows and has come across, we know a lot less, um, a lot of people who are testing are testing with home tests and those don't get reported to the county. So there are a lot more people who are positive and fortunately, you know, especially people who are fully vaccinated often don't have symptoms that where they need to go to the doctor and some, never even, you know, have enough to test. So um, Omicron is clearly out there everywhere. And uh, just um, just so, because on both sides, people get confused by the numbers. So I wanted to share what the county was sharing, make sure that was your understanding as well. That is my understanding, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay. Are there other questions or comments for Dawn? Uh, just a very quick comment. Obviously, uh, the number of people that are infected has grown enormously, and uh, it is a time for everyone uh, to, to be as prudent as you can possibly be. Uh, and Omicron, uh, as everyone mm -hmm. know, knows, uh, is extremely uh, contagious, uh, and I can verify that. So thank you. With that, we will move Madam on. Madam Mayor, I'm so sorry. I didn't raise my hand earlier, but oh, if I could. You. I apologize. Make a comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as the council and the public knows, I've been holding bi-weekly COVID working group meeting. So that's um, from our uh, work with Desert AIDS Project, DAP Health, um, Eisenhower, Desert Regional and Desert Care Network, um, many of the senior centers in the Western Coachella Valley, um, Jewish Family Services and other social service providers. So um, we met uh, this week to talk about the availability of testing um, in our region. Obviously, we're hearing from so many of our residents that it's nearly impossible to find a test right now. Um, so we requested that the county um, and through Supervisor Perez's office um, and Greg Rodriguez um, to open a testing site again in the city of Palm Springs. Obviously, we had a discussion about how hard it is that we're back almost where we started and trying to ramp up testing again. Um, but here we are. So really glad that the county sounds like they're um, operating um, and staffing up a testing site at James O. Jesse. So thank you to city staff for working on that um, and making sure that testing is widely available to our community. Um, so if you are experiencing issues like that, please do email us um, and we can um, do things like that, like work with the county get to get a testing site in our community. So thank you to everyone for their work on that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions, comments? All right. 
and we will move on uh, to a sustainability update on the Foodware Ordinance and SB 1383. And with that, we will go to uh, Flynn Fagg, our Director of Development Services. Madam Mayor, members of council, good evening. And we're happy to report to you this evening on a couple of initiatives underway in our Office of Sustainability. If you'll give me just a moment, let me go ahead and share my screen. So the first item that I would like to discuss with you this evening is relative to Senate Bill 1383, which as you're probably aware, deals with the reduction of organic waste in our landfills. The goal of the bill is to reduce organic waste in landfills by 75% by 2025. The bill went into effect on January 1st, but here in Palm Springs, we anticipate that our implementation date will be October the 1st of this year. The reason for the delayed implementation is due to the fact that there are equipment shortages for the bins, as well as the facilities available for disposal of organic waste. Uh, in terms of what this is going to look like for our residents, by October the 1st, residents will then have available to them a three bin system. The brown cart and the blue cart, as we already have the brown cart for refuse that will go into the landfill, the blue cart is for our recycling materials for plastics, aluminum, and other recyclables. And then on October 1st, uh, residents will also have a green cart, which is primarily for food waste and yard waste. Um, when the green cart service begins, residents will be asked to put their organic waste in a plastic bag and put that in the green cart along with any yard waste that you may have. Uh, there are different sizes available depending on residents' needs in terms of the amount of refuse that's collected there. Along with the implementation of 1383, one of the other things that we are working on, as you're probably aware, is an update to our franchise agreement with Palm Springs Disposal Service. Staff and our attorneys have been meeting with Palm Springs Disposal Service on the amendments to the agreement we anticipate that we'll be able to bring that forward to City Council probably at your second meeting in February. With the approval of the franchise agreement, we will then bring forth the rate schedule to address the uh, implementation of organic waste. Uh, we'll put forth the public hearing notice probably in May of this year. There's a 45-day circulation period for that public notice, uh, and then a hearing will be held, we anticipate, in June. And then finally, new rates to address the implementation of organic waste will go into effect on October 1st, as will the service. We will be bringing forward a couple of resolutions to you related to this at your next city council meeting. We anticipate that both of these items will be on the consent agenda, but just wanted to make you aware of them. Uh, the first is relative of our intent to comply with SB 1383. Uh, by filing a resolution uh, approved by the City Council with CalRecycle, uh, CalRecycle will waive any penalties um, to us in terms of implementation and correction of violations. So that's critical in terms of our implementation process for SB 1383. And then secondly, we're applying for a grant, which also requires a resolution of the City Council uh, this will help us in our uh, implementation of SB 1383. So that will also be on your next agenda. Uh, so that is my presentation on Senate Bill 1383. The next item that I'd like to review with you is implementation of our foodware ordinance. The foodware ordinance went into effect on January the 1st. To assist us in implementing the ordinance, the city has engaged two consulting firms who have been out in the community meeting with business owners and providing assistance to them in understanding and implementing the ordinance. In the month of December, the consulting firms contacted a total of 91 businesses and that outreach effort is ongoing. In terms of the outreach effort itself, one of the primary purposes of having our consultants meet with businesses 
is to evaluate their specific needs and to assist them in selecting the products that may be appropriate for them to uh, conform to the city's foodware ordinance. Uh, we also offer a scholarship program. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And then also offer signage to businesses informing customers of the changes in foodware requirements. In terms of the scholarship program, we're offering $750 scholarships to businesses to assist them in implementing the foodware ordinance. And that can be used for a variety of things, everything from reus reusable food service uh, to sanitizing equipment and washing equipment to the purchase of bulk uh, dispensers for condiments to avoid the use of single service packets. With the implementation of the ordinance, we do also have a provision for waivers, and we are more than happy to consult with businesses relative to any issues they may be having in implementing the ordinance. Uh, for example, there may be a need for certain types of containers for hot liquids or certain types of straws for thicker drinks. And so we're able to do a waiver for those types of things. Uh, we also look at things such as storage space or areas for washing equipment and things like that. And so we're trying to do our best in terms of our outreach to businesses to address specific needs and to assist them in implementing the ordinance. With that, if there are any businesses out there who do have questions about the foodware ordinance, we would encourage them to contact our Office of Sustainability. Uh, Tracy Sheldon is available to answer their questions as well as our consultants who can meet with businesses on site. If you need any assistance, please contact us at 760-323-8248. And with that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my presentation to you this evening. Uh, again, we thank you for your time and assistance with these items. With that, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Uh, are there any questions or comments for the director? I see uh, Council Member Woods. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, Flynn, uh, um, if I understood you correctly, for the food waste that's up and coming, um, it goes into the yard waste container, one and the same, but you want the food waste put into a plastic bag? I, I mean, that seems counterintuitive. That's why I wanted it, to- It that. does, and I ask that same question because it does seem counterintuitive. There's a couple of reasons for that, as I understand it. Number one, because of our climate, it does need to be bagged in order to address odors. Uh, and then secondly, in terms of delivery of that food waste to the spot where it will be turned into compost, uh, they do need it in bags in order to uh, properly sort that at the facility itself. Uh, and then they're able to recycle the bags there, as I understand it. So again, you're correct. It does seem counterintuitive, but that's the way that uh, they've asked us to go about that. And for those people who currently have a green waste can, you know, some already have it because they use it for yard waste. Can they start this program ahead of October or no? I don't believe that we're set up to do that quite yet. What we will do is once we can use the existing containers for food waste, we'll send a notice to residents through Palm Springs Disposal Service. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you. Um, Flynn, does it have to be a plastic bag? Could it be a different, a biodegradable bag or a paper bag? As far as I understand it, it could be a biodegradable bag, um, but what we will do is as part of our frequently asked questions that we have on the city website, we'll provide more uh, information about what type of bags can be used for the food waste. Okay, and then for anybody who wants to kind of get in the habit of doing this now, do we have any place to deposit compost like this material and before October? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a citywide site available yet. We have had discussions with a group in terms of a location on city property where we may be able to do that. Uh, as soon as we have that available, we'll make that information available to residents as well. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions for, uh, for the director? Uh, Flynn, I have one. Uh, we had a couple of restaurants that uh, have reached out to me that uh, they had purchased uh, uh, very large supplies of uh, foodware containers uh, some some years ago before we implemented uh, 
uh, the new policies. Uh, and they're asking if they could exhaust uh, their existing supply. They are certainly not asking to, uh, uh, to not buy uh, in the future. Uh, what, uh, what approach can we offer to them? How can, how can we help? What I would recommend is that they fill out one of our waiver request forms. We've had a number of businesses do the same thing where they've got quite a supply of paper goods and products and plasticware, et cetera. Uh, the intent is that they would be able to use those materials and then as soon as they exhaust them, they will switch over to conforming products. So using our waiver process, we're able to address that with businesses. Very good. Thank you for that flexibility. All right. There are no other questions. We'll move on to our next presentation, which is really a presentation that she should have been able to deliver uh, at the last meeting while still uh, in the mayor's role, uh, but graciously deferred to this meeting. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, former Mayor uh, Christy Holstage for a review of 2021 and the work that was done by city council. Thank you, Mayor, I appreciate that. I am going to attempt to share my screen. <clears throat> you could just give me one moment. <clears throat> of course, it never works when you need it to. You know, I'm sorry, Mayor, it's not allowing me to uh, share my screen at this time because of the Zoom settings. I have to re-log in. So if we could wait for that presentation and hold and go through the agenda and then we'll do it maybe in my council member comments. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will defer that item. We'll move on now to the acceptance of the agenda. Uh, the city council will discuss the order of the agenda and may amend the order and add any urgency items. No abstentions or no votes on the consent calendar items or request consent calendar items be removed for a separate discussion. I would like to entertain a motion to accept the agenda and are there any items that, a, that staff or a council member would like removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion? our vote. Uh, council member Coors. Yeah, I'd like to remove, <coughs> excuse me, remove item 1H. 1H, okay. And are there any other items to be removed for separate discussion? Uh, city manager. Yes, uh, Mayor, if you would please, we'd like to request that we move item 5D, which is a memorandum of understanding for two of our bargaining units to the consent agenda. They're typically placed on the consent agenda and this one was inadvertently placed uh, on the uh, later in the agenda. Thank you. Is there any objection to that? Good, all right. Are there any other changes to the agenda? Then the... Agenda is approved with item 1H, uh, deferred for further discussion and item 5D, move to consent. So with that, I would like to get a report of the closed session and I request city attorney Ballinger to provide us that report of closed session. Yes, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, members of the public, the City Council met in closed session to discuss the items that are listed on the agenda. The Council did not get to the two uh, real property discussions, but they did discuss the other items and there was no reportable action. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, next item is public testimony on- Madam Mayor? Yes. Uh, could we take a roll call vote on the acceptance of the agenda? We typically do that. Uh, my apology. Please go ahead. No problem. Uh, somebody want to make a motion? So moved. moved second. By, moved and seconded. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kors? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner? Yes. Council Member Halstech? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Mayor Middleton? Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
With that, we will move on to public testimony on non-public he hearing agenda items only. The next item is public testimony. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on non-public hearing agenda items only. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You are asked to please begin your time by telling us what agenda item or items you are speaking about. Please note that public testimony, that testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the public hearing and general public comment for subjects not on the agenda will be taken later in the evening. Tonight, the city clerk will be contacting speakers via telephone. Uh, Mr. Mejia. David Feltman, you're live at the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Okay, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council. Um, thank you for this time. I am calling in about item um, 1Q, the award of the construction for the wall uh, between the wastewater treatment plant and Duluth Park. Um, I'm hoping that the city manager um, and maybe the head of engineering can um, inform the public about the construction timeline for this, any interference it will have with uh, for access to um, park facilities, if there are any. And also, um, I may have missed this in the earlier um, review of this project, but how this will actually mitigate um, the smell odor issues that um, are prevalent at the park. So I'm hoping that will be addressed by uh, city manager and city staff at some point this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ragda Zachariah, you're live at the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Yes, good evening, City Council. I'm call, um, contacting you regarding item 5A, the Navigation Center, which is under seeking funds for Project Home Key. Um, I'm very impressed with the staff report, the 21 pages, and I'm looking at it right now in full because I did download it. Um, however, that report is still full of holes that really uh, put together based on assumptions. But what I'd like to bring your attention to two items. In that report, it says you want to communicate with the neighborhood and educate them about the homeless issues and um, and so on. However, I feel like if you look at the map, this potential project that you're trying so hard to put it in place, and actually we're not pleased that you put it on the agenda this evening, tucked under a different title, because this item is all about the navigation center with if you look at the map on the north and west side hello yeah we can hear you oh, okay if you look at palm spring villa one palm spring villa two uh desert highland we're all all of us in touch with each other and we are not in, con in agreement of this project to be in our residential area we are trying very hard to enhance that area. And you need to show us some respect. You need to meet with us first, try to educate us, give us what you are planning to do instead of coming back the other way. So I encourage you to start with meeting with us um, as a community and let's see if we can work something out. But I assure you, uh, none of us is happy with that. And we are going to continue making sure this doesn't happen, unfortunately. I will look forward to see your discussion about the report. But again, I would like to thank the staff about the putting this wonderful report. But again, it does have a lot of underlining that's not clear and needs to be addressed first. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Uh, Joan, yes. if you could reduce the volume in the background, and you are live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mayor and members of the Council. As a conservationist and Palm Springs resident for nearly 60 years, I'd like to thank you for bringing forward Item 1D, 
uh, this important resolution is really necessary to meet the state's decarbonization goals. We need an all hands on deck approach to ramp up renewable energy, as well as energy efficiency, local storage and demand response. Speaking for Sierra Club, the California Public Utility Commission's proposed decision as drafted would devastate California's rooftop solar industry and its numerous corresponding climate, air quality, land use, resiliency and local reliability benefits. Not to mention local jobs here to support the rooftop solar industry in the valley where we need them. The state agency's SB100 report demonstrated that substantial additional distributed rooftop solar is needed in addition to utility scale generation to meet California's goals. In fact, customer cited goal according to the report needs to triple over the next decade or two. But while the PUC proposed decision purports to support solar and storage deployment, its calculations are based on flawed assumptions and it would in fact kill local solar. solar. The CPUC must substantially revise the proposed decision and correct its numerous factual and legal errors. We urge you to pass your well-drafted resolution in support of preserving growth of local solar net energy meeting and decarbonization of the state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paisley Ramstead, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Paisley Ramstead. I'm the staff biologist for the Oswit Land Trust. I'd like to comment on agenda item 1I regarding the city's plans to implement a flood control project on South Palm Canyon. In 2019, Oswit Land Trust hired an engineer with a specialty in water resources, stormwater, and environmental engineering as this uh, project would interrupt the natural drainage system and cause further destruction to the Oswit Cone wildland area. Because of this, Oswit Land Trust would love the, the opportunity to discuss with the city our engineer's full report before any further funding is allocated to an expensive project with potentially damaging ecological consequences. That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment, and we were able to reach everyone that uh, desired to. And just for uh, the public's awareness, uh, if you wanted to speak on item 2B or on a non-agenda public comment, uh, that will be taken later in the evening. Thank you. Mr. Mejia, thank you. Uh, now we will move on to city council, subcommittee, and city manager comments. And uh, I'm hoping that we can begin with... Uh, uh, former Mayor Holstage and uh, a review of 2021. There she is. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, I'm at home and I also have a toddler at home. Okay, can everyone see my screen this time? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Mayor and the City Council. I thought that this would be important as a group and for our community to just share the work that we've done together. Um, often we hear from our residents, you know, what are you doing there at City Hall? What is City Council up to? You know, asking us about the progress that we've made. And I think it's really impressive to look and see an entire year's work of work, worth of work. And obviously it was a unique year as we continue to just um, struggle through and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I just wanted to go over it and make sure that um, the community sees really our proof of results. Um, so thinking back, and it might be a bit of a depressing exercise, uh, in December 2020. Um, so you'll remember back that uh, City Council worked with the County of Riverside to offer free testing at our convention center. We passed an ordinance protecting local businesses from being charged uh, for third-party delivery apps like Uber Eats. 
students. Um, the City of Palm Springs Sustainability Office launched the Sustainability Scholarship Program to help local businesses defray costs um, for sustainability projects. I know a lot of those have moved forward and those are really great. The Palm Springs Bureau of Tourism launched a We Are Palm Springs promotional campaign about local supporting local businesses. Um, in January 2021, the council approved $1 million in COVID uh, small business financial aid um, and providing forgivable loans to small businesses. In January 2021, we hired Jeff, Justin Clifton, our city manager um, for the city of Palm Springs. Um, we also approved an agreement with Tesla to install 13 additional free superchargers in our downtown parking structure. In February 2021, the Chequala Gate um, were removed, allowing pedestrian access to the public sidewalks in the El Mirador neighborhood. In February, um, we also, the city hosted with Fine Food Bank, a free diaper distribution at the Palm Springs Convention Center. We also worked really closely throughout the year with Fine Food Bank and the National Guard um, to provide mass food distribution sites at our convention center, um, feeding um, tens of thousands of families throughout the Coachella Valley. The council also voted to expand the city's electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and we authorized the installation of up to 33 new charging stations downtown and city hall. The Palm Springs Convention Center opened as a mass COVID-19 vaccination site and partner with the county and 42,000 vaccines um, were distributed there. The city also worked to do vaccine buddies with DAP Health and so many community partners trying to connect a vulnerable community members to vaccine appointments. The, the Palm Springs City Council passed a hero pay ordinance requiring grocery stores um, to provide hero or premium pay for their workers who were feeding our community during the pandemic. The City Council authorized the City Attorney's Office to proceed with legal action um, to force the owners of the four stalled hotels uh, to on Dawes Hotel, the Dream Hotel, the Orchid Tree, and the Tova to resolve those uncompleted, incompleted projects. Um, the city also was awarded nearly $900,000 in cannabis social equity funds through the Governor's Office. In March, um, the Tova property was demolished. Uh, the Andaz Hotel was rebranded as a Thompson property and slated uh, to open soon at the end of 2022. In April 2021, um, we participated in the 10th anniversary of the National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation and worked with Desert Water Agency to ask residents to commit to using water more wisely. Um, in April, we also adopted an ordinance establishing breeding permits to regulate the responsible breeding of dogs and cats. In May, and I know everyone can read these here on the screen and the public can see them, but I just think it's really important to actually go over the work that we did because these are hundreds of hours of staff time and um, a lot of council time and just important for the community to know. Um, we passed a community workforce agreement um, to provide goals for local high and training programs for City of Palm Springs public work projects over a million dollars. Um, we also assessed our greenhouse gas emissions and found that we exceeded the state of California's ambitious goals um, and reduced our uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 16%. Um, and that's a direct result of Desert Community Energy, a program launched in April 2020. In June, uh, we opened City Hall and other city facilities safely and successfully to the public. We passed an ordinance requiring cannabis businesses with five or more employees to enter labor peace agreements. Um, we unveiled Forever Maryland on Museum Way to much fanfare and controversy. On July, in July 2021, um, we held several public workshops um, and updated our housing element to plan for the building of 2,500 additional units in this next cycle and hopefully more. We also um, presented a proclamation proclaiming June 19th, 2021 as Juneteenth. We passed the ordinance that was just discussed for reducing single-use plastic 
plastics and polystyrene or styrofoam in food service. And um, we opened a 24-hour cooling center at the United Methodist Church with Martha's Village and Kitchen. In August, uh, we completed a $36 million airport ticket wing expansion. We held a count special council meeting um, to pa pass an ordinance requiring patrons to show proof of COVID-19 vaccination or a negative test to enter bars and restaurants. In September, we opened the Palm Springs Access Center, a new daytime drop-in facility with Martha's Village and Kitchen for homeless residents. We named our dog park um, after our former city manager, Dr. David Reddy. We issued an apology for Section 14 and the for the role the city played um, in 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 that in Section 14, um, and we also unanimously uh, voted to begin the process of removing the Bogart statue in front of City Hall after hearing from our residents. In October 2021, Palm Springs Police Department received implicit bias training. Um, we also hired our new police chief, Andy Mills from Santa Cruz. Um, we had our grand park, excuse me, our grand opening for our downtown park and a community celebration. We had a groundbreaking for Monarch Apartments, the city's first new affordable housing project in over 12 years. We also installed rainbow crosswalks in the Arenas District, something many of us have been working on for years and years. In November, uh, we began the 2021 redistricting process. We held a special closed session meetings to develop our priorities and a strategic plan for the city council and the city. We also voted to move forward on a homeless navigation center. We set a goal of achieving total carbon neutrality by 2030 um, in our city's climate action roadmap. And we directed staff to continue to um, work on the Cool Cities Challenge and conservation efforts. Um, in December 2021, the council approved a development agreement between the city and the Desert AIDS Project um, so that they can complete construction of an 18,000 square foot medical office. Um, we passed an ordinance reducing speed limits along certain street segments after years of work by Mayor Middleton and city staff. Uh, we unveiled new public art, like a new sculpture um, at the Palm Springs Swim Center, and we opened an overnight shelter at the Palm Springs Access Center in response to severe weather so that our homeless residents could um, have somewhere to sleep during the rain and cold. So with that, thank you. Um, this is obviously a team effort of all of the work that city staff um, and the city council has been working on um, in addition to all the work that city staff does every single day and that each council member works on. So I thought that might be um, important for the community to know about. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for your leadership under a very challenging set of circumstances last year. Are there others uh, from city council who would like to make any reports? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you. Um, I just have a few announcements. One is that I'll have a District 1 virtual town hall on Saturday, January 22nd at 1 p.m. Um, so I will put up that information on how to access the Zoom link for that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that part of our consent calendar at today's meeting includes um, having two stoplights go out to bid, one at Rosa Parks and Indian Canyon, and the other at Caballeros and San Rafael. Um, these have been in the works for the last couple of years, and it's exciting to know that construction will hopefully be beginning on those very soon. So to all the residents who have been um, anxiously awaiting them, they're coming um, this year. They'll definitely be here this year, so that's very good. Uh, and then just the last thing I wanted to say is that I have two interns, um, one who's a Palm Springs resident, uh, Dalia Rodriguez, and she lives in District 1. And then I also have an intern who is a student at um, CSUSB Palm Desert campus, Johnny Arredondo. And 
They are working on two separate things. Dalia is helping me with community outreach, um, specifically doing uh, Spanish language outreach and helping to connect some of our neighborhoods in District 1 that are not part of 1PS yet, which has largely been due to kind of language barriers. And she's assisting me with, with that and some really direct action in the, in the district. And then Johnny is assisting me with research and writing um, regarding youth programs and possibilities for ways for us as a city to um, ease into doing some more workforce development for our young people. You know, as we'll talk about more on our visioning session, um, you know, we can't do everything all at once, but we can take small steps towards these larger goals that we have. So I just wanted to let the community know about um, that and just so that any young people that you know who are interested in interning with me, please, you know, have them reach out anytime. You know, I won't be having a, another intern until probably uh, this, the beginning of the summer, but it's good to connect with anyone that's interested anytime so that I can have them on my radar. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Woods, do you have anything to report? No, I just want to uh, uh, thank um, Council Member Holstage for a great summary of a year. Uh, not only did we accomplish more than was on that presentation, but we did it at a very hard time during COVID. So uh, thank you for putting that together. Right. And uh, Mr. Clifton, and I'm going to get to you, Mr. Kors. Okay. Uh, thank you. Is there anything that you have? I don't have anything this evening, Mayor. Okay, thank you. And I would like to uh, say thank you to all of the uh, residents uh, who extended uh, very kind greetings to me over the last uh, week uh, as uh, I did test positive for uh, COVID-19. I had the, the milder symptoms uh, and uh, am very pleased to report that yesterday I uh, tested negative and uh, I will be out driving slowly at the speed limit across uh, the city of Palm Springs, uh, much to the irritation of drivers who want to drive far faster than the speed limit uh, in Palm Springs. And, uh, with that, uh, I, uh, Council Member Holstead, yes. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to do one more Council Member update separate from my presentation. I wanted to thank Chief Mills for uh, driving through uh, District 4 with me. I was really grateful for him to spend a few hours uh, really talking about the public safety impacts on our district um, and, and show him around. So really want to um, thank him for his commitment to Palm Springs. <coughs> he even um, came to my house and showed my baby the lights on the car and my son was really impressed by his badge. So really glad to have Chief Mills um, leading our department and just wanted to thank him. All right. And last but not least this evening, Council Member Kors. Well, thank you, Mayor. And um, really thank you, Council Member Holstage. I'm sure that took a bunch of work to pull that together, but really good to share with the community uh, all those things. And um, it was good to look back on them as well. Uh, so since our last meeting, I've had you know, by six, seven, uh, since we uh, holidays and didn't have a meeting at the end of December, meetings with the various tourism and business organizations. Um, one thing I wanna share um, is, as I'm a liaison uh, to the Chamber of Commerce, um, but they've announced that they're launching a free concert series in the downtown park um, called Rock the Park. Um, and, you know, they do their retreat um, minus COVID years up in Lake Arrowhead. And I, I joined them for the concept series up there. And uh, Nona Watson, the CEO, and I started talking about how to do that when the park opened. And once the park opened, she just jumped on it, um, found out who had organized it and how it happened up in Arrowhead. Um, it's being sponsored by the city. Um, PS Resorts, uh, the Bureau of Tourism, as well as the Chamber. The Chamber is doing all the staff working as well. Uh, the first one will be an Eagles tribute band, um, who I happen to have seen, and they're really, really fun. February 2nd, 7, 8, 7 p.m. 
Um, and they're going to be at the first Wednesday every month. And Wednesday was picked after, you know, talking to businesses that that's the slowest time, right? We have the least tourists, people who stay over weekends. And a lot of our merchants and downtown restaurants um, aren't as busy, so they'll bring people. And it makes more room for all our residents to really get to enjoy this amenity while on a weekend, it would be much harder. So really excited about this. Other um, tribute bands are... Uh, an Elton John performer who um, tours the world, a um, Madonna performer, a Tina Turner performer, a Fleetwood Mac tribute band, and Creedence Clearwater Revival um, band. And the goal is to get different types of music. And I just, it's so great to see our park open and now this kind of um, thing going forward. And if it's as successful as we all hope, I think it's something we're gonna get to continue all year. Uh, but the first six months, um, already set. So just really excited and wanted to share that. Um, the Hospitality Association meeting today, sort of want to share, um, and I share data with them, which we all just got today, but uh, TOT uh, for the first five months of this fiscal year is up almost 50% from the last year without COVID, 2018-19. And so um, the hotels are doing well, you know, most of the restaurants uh, are doing well. We know some are having a hard time. Um, and even with the cold weather, uh, they did um, overall well. Um, some of the hotels are seeing some decrease in groups and the convention center saw a little due to Omicron, uh, but the hotels overall have said they're seeing an increase making up for it in leisure travel at the moment. So uh, people are pretty optimistic and hoping that we get through this quickly, uh, but generally uh, very positive. Um, and we've had six new uh, retail businesses open in December. So we're, we're definitely uh, seeing some good things there. Just see if there's anything else from us. Um, the last thing I do wanna share with my colleagues and staff in the public is that um, I am not gonna be running for a third term in November. And I wanted to make sure uh, folks know that as I know I've heard from some folks who are interested in running um, and you know, seeing what the maps look like at last time really helped folks in that process but I did wanna make sure I shared that in a public forum. And having listened to uh, Council Member Holstage's report of last year, and I know we're doing our strategic planning update for the public for a wave ahead. Uh, and I wanna get all of that done. So we have a lot of work to do and I'm looking forward to working with everyone and our residents and staff and colleagues to get that done. So thank you, Madam Mayor. All right. And thank you, Council Member Coors. And on behalf of all on city council, uh, and City Hall, it has been an absolute honor to work with you and we look forward to the next year. Thank you. Uh, with that, we uh, have already approved the consent calendar, so we will move on to the one item that we have pulled, which is item 1H and uh, Council Member Kors, uh pulled that item. So, uh, and, is that- I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. Yes. Uh, it's, it's a little different. We, we approved the order of the agenda, uh, we would now take a vote to approve the consent calendar. All right, then let's go ahead and do that. So moved. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Holstech. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. All right. Uh, Item 1H, uh, Council Member Coors, uh, would you like a ex uh, staff report uh, to be uh, explained or is this comment? Um, I think I can explain it and staff can correct me. So this is um, to approve our annual slurry seal to you know, maintain our roads that are at a, as I understand it, a good level uh, moving forward, um, which we do every year so we don't have to do the kind of uh, major road repaving uh, permanent road repairs. Is that is that good, Joel? Is that sufficient? Yeah, yeah, it is. I was, I'm sorry, I was trying to catch on, <laughs> log on. I missed the first part of your statement. Oh, uh, just why we do the slurry seals, right? To keep the roads that we that are in good condition in good condition. Long yeah, long. exactly. That's one of the misconceptions out there that uh, a lot of folks think that a slurry seal is doing something. Uh, really uh, repave the street, but it really is. And it's, it's actually, we're adding a, an oil coating to streets that are in better condition so that we can extend the life of, of our, our infrastructure. 
Great. So thanks. So I've um, I had sort of two questions um, or one question and a comment maybe. So you know, in the past, we always have budget constraints as we do this. Um, and so my question is: Are we doing all the slurry seals that you think we should be doing now, or is it a budget issue that may keep us from doing what you think we sh we need to be doing now? Um, well, more money always is better, correct? So we, the more money we have to do more uh, more slurry seals, the better. I think we're we're using a million dollars to do slurry seal. If we added, say, another million, two million dollars worth of slurry seals, would would improve and allow us to. Um, so let me see how I can describe this. So the city has been aggressive in repaving streets and we started, you know, a while ago. So now it's time to actually go back to those streets that we repaved and slurry them. So if we have an additional uh, million dollars per se, we would go back and start capturing those streets so that we can actually extend the life of those streets by, you know, 5, 10, 20 years. So um, I think if we didn't have budget constraints and we were allowed to use another million dollars, we would bet the city's infrastructure would benefit. Our streets would, would actually be improved and, and their condition would last longer. Right. And so that's then leads to a different a follow up, which is if we let's say we spent two million, um, I know, which is not being proposed tonight, but uh, in the long term, does that save us money? Absolutely. Uh, in the long term, it does prolong our well, essentially, you're extending the life of your infrastructure. So the longer you extend it, the less money you have to invest to do the, 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 the additional paving or the actual reconstruction of the street. So, yes. Um, we've already invested in our infrastructure by repaving the old streets, right? And if we repave those streets and we want to prolong their life, if we invest in slurry, then we prolong the life of those streets. So long-term, the city does benefit from it, correct? So, um, and maybe that's a question for our city manager, but um, obviously I, I want to approve this, but um, maybe before it goes out to contract, we could bring back to council some other op some options to potentially increase funding if you think the budget is there for that as you know we want to invest now having um you know most of us you know uh remember how bad our roads got during the recession and that we ended up spending a lot more money repaving them than if we were able to maintain them so uh, i don't know if that's something we bring back you know at another meeting but i i'd like us to have some flexibility if given other priorities of course you know after you have time to look at it uh, that we could do so. Um, and the same thing, the other thing I was going to raise is I know staff's working on our road repaving project. And last time we wanted to do two years of our sort of average at once, but also we still have some that are just still in the poor category by just a little, it looks like, but, you know, it would be good for us to know what it would cost to get everything into fair or good category. Um, and what's doable in a shorter amount of time, because we still have some roads that are in really not great condition. And we've done amazing. I mean, you've done an amazing job getting us to where we are. Yeah. So as far as the, the paving program, and um, we spent, we were typically spending about $3 million a year. Then we went to $6 million. Um, in discussions with Measure J, we were requesting another $6 million to, to do that as well for next year. So $6 million, according to our payment management plan, is probably where we want to be. I mean, if we start spending $8, 9000000 million, we're, we're going to um, the project is going to get too big and we're just essentially going to be paving, to, you know, year round. So a, a good, uh, I'm estimating a good budget is between six and $8 million. You know, if we start spending, we, we wouldn't be able to spend a $10 million because it's just a project that's going to be continuous nonstop. So I think with the $6 million, according to our payment management plan, that's, it maintains our payment condition index of where it is right now and slightly improves it over the next five years. So I think a, a good uh, budget is the $6 million for repaving. But if we had one more million, it would, it would improve it a little bit. The, the thing to understand that right now, the payment condition index goes from say 100 to zero and we're essentially right in the middle of the pavement condition index so it seems like we're not doing that there are so many other streets that could benefit it but because we use this particular uh number this number allows us to you know set aside the, the streets that need to be paved every year and without really not thinking about it but it's basically it's a set criteria and we're not moving streets back and forth and eventually we'll start getting past that curve and, and getting to the, the higher numbers, if you will. So in the next project, whether it's six, seven or 8 million, well, we get all the streets that are sort of in that just at 55, which is sort of the difference between poor and fair. 
out of that that level to a better level? I think we, now it, if, right now, I think it's going to be about between the next two to three years, we would start getting to the other side of, of that of that curve. Uh, but yeah, it would be six million over the next three, four years to start moving to the other side. And then, as we mentioned earlier, the slurry it starts increasing because we want to keep maintain those streets at a at a good condition. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so, to the city manager, on sort of your thoughts on doing more slurry sealing now, if that in the long term is going to be cost effective and beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. I think the bottom line is we want to sustain our infrastructure over time and we want to invest in it annually. So you can think about our major assets. They depreciate over time. They have a fixed lifespan. We want to invest kind of an equal amount annually, ideally, over that lifespan. So if asphalt lasts 40 years, but we need to improve it, you know, say at intervals of 10 or 12 and it's different per street, we want to put the money away every year to do that work. And, and so it's, as uh, Joel described, we kind of maintain an index. You do want to get all the useful life out of your asphalt. You don't want to replace it too soon because um, then you kind of have sunk costs and, and, and wasted resources, but you, you definitely want to sustain an effort over time with not just roads, but other infrastructure and, and make sure we have the money set aside to do it. And we'll be working on those plans across the board with roads and other major infrastructure as part of the budget process. Okay. And it's something that um, staff can look at um, whether we should um, and whatever uh, staff thinks best, but if you think we should increase the slurry seal, if that's going to be beneficial um, amount and bring that back, even if we approve, if, if we approve this tonight. Absolutely. And, okay. and so part of sustaining that infrastructure is really looking at what happens if we let it go too far. Yep. Um, what happens if we invest too early and finding that sweet spot where we can kind of sustain and extend the life of any asset as long as possible and, 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 Try not to think too much about um, spending money on other things today and leaving problems for you know others down the road. We want to set the city up so that all of those things are taken care of each and every year. They're essentially out of sight, out of mind. And then we're really honest with ourselves about the resources that are left to be invested in other things. But we should never really neglect our infrastructure. And we should always be at that ideal point where you know spending a dollar today, if it can save us two tomorrow, if that's a smart thing to do and we have the money, we should always do that. Okay, great, thank you. Are there other uh, council member Woods? Uh, uh, thank you, thank you for bringing it up, council member Kors. Um, You know, um, I've always been a proponent of trying to do more slurry seal and be proactive in this. And I know we had a setback during the pandemic when we reduced our budget, there was big concerns. And one of the things we cut back on was our road repairs, which um, was aggravating to me, but something I understood we had to do we have come out of that rather strong. Another thing that we did is on the Measure J process, and I just want clarity, on the Measure J process, we deferred in the last budget session how that Measure J money might or might not be spent. So I would like to know if that $6 million you're referring to is already allocated or if that's something that's gonna come back to us before the next budget process because we still haven't addressed Measure, a fun Measure J funding. Right, that's exactly right. It's 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 an amount of money that you'll see in the future with the next budget cycle. So it hasn't been approved yet for the six million dollars to not by council. No, we're currently in okay. in the current project is is six million dollars. So the goal is to continue that and and request that of council it, it, with the budget. And that would be a time to bring up um, council member cores and my concern about can we ex, you know can we expedite it at all? And if so, what are the pros and cons of that? Right. And 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 Joe, when can we expect that discussion to happen? I'll defer to the city manager, but we will be bringing that back with the budget, to, to, to with our five-year CIP and, and the budget. So it's, it is coming in the future. So I'll defer to the city manager to, for an actual timeline. Sure. We, we had a staff meeting just recently to have this very conversation and the conversation about solidifying that five-year CIP. So to clarify, in this year's budget, we did put the $6 million in for a kind of pavement preservation type projects. Um, the uh, bulk of the CIP was kind of, we put in a placeholder. Right now, engineering has all the projects that it can handle um, really for the foreseeable future, probably the next six months at least. So the rest of the CIP conversation will probably come forward as part of next year's budget. And those conversations will be largely in April and May. And we'll make sure we carve out a significant amount of time, not just for the entire budget, but for the CIP in particular, so that you can really scrutinize some of these uh, components when it comes to roads, you know, sources like Measure J, other important projects. 
So over the next few months, we'll be having a lot of those conversations. Thank you. Any other comments from uh, anyone else on council? And I wanna add my voice to uh, uh, council member Woods and council member Coors on this issue. I would very much like to see us uh, come back uh, at a later time for a much more robust discussion as to how we can accelerate uh, the road repairs that, uh, that are needed on our city. We still have dozens of streets uh, that are listed in poor condition. And if I heard correctly, we've got uh, a timeline that goes out for two, three years to bring every street up uh, to a fair condition. And our ultimate goal uh, should be to have every street in the city at least at a satisfactory level. Uh, so this is something that uh, I think we do need to prioritize uh, and clearly manage well. Uh, the last comment I've had is on this particular uh, PCI scoring uh, is the first time I've seen uh, decibels or decimals uh, where we're giving ratings out to three, four, five, six. And Joel, I know you're incredible, uh, but if you can tell me the difference between 55.0012 and 55.0013 in the condition of a street, I'm gonna nominate you for engineer of the year. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be able to. We do use, the company we hire is a third party company. We use a computer program that uses, you know, certain inputs and their, their inputs from, you know, past uh, treatments of the street and past ratings. So the computer has to do its, its thing. We do visual analysis. So yeah, we, it, it, I don't think there's a better system out there that we're, but we are using a system that is generally fair. And if you find, when you see our maps, that we're paving and we're looking at these little numbers, the 0.004, you see that they're generally concentrated along the same area. So you, you can tell that the, the, the pavement is deteriorating and the project was, or those streets were probably paved around the 60s or 70s. And you can see that, yeah, it is concentrated. So the computer program does, is fairly accurate. It works and it, it does have its flaws. And over time, we've worked on trying to get those flaws. As a matter of fact, we're gonna start working on the next pavement management program. So we'll update it and, and uh, Hopefully we can do better, but yeah, the decimal points, I, I think the moment is very difficult to explain, uh, but it is a system we have. I, I, previously, we didn't publish those decimals, and if we are not absolutely required to, I urge uh, that we drop them, because uh, they do have consequences, and, and we can't explain it. Some of the most uh, angry conversations I've had uh, with uh, constituents has been when the street next to them, uh, not their street, had a rating of 54 and they had a rating of 55 and they were, they wanted me to uh, walk the street uh, for hours uh, trying to prove that uh, uh, street A was in fact in worse condition than street B and frankly they were both almost identical. Yeah. I've had, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I've had, <laughs> I, I don't know, I want to say hundreds of conversations <laughs> about the same topic and emails. <laughs> so, yeah, I do appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Council Member Holstich. Thank you. Um, thanks for everyone's comments. And yes, I know this is such a um, topic that our residents are interested in. Um, I think I agree with what's been said. Um, I know that we've talked about this for many years, like just having a true analysis of how much we need to invest at what times, right, to get, um, have the most um, efficient Pro road maintenance program, right? So I'm fully on board with that. I just want to make sure that we're talking about this in the context of all of the maintenance that we have to do for our community centers, for our city buildings. We have such aging infrastructure and I would hate to, um, because this is kind of separate and apart from that, um, you know, only focus on this um, and, and, and not, um, you know, I'd love to see $6 million a year for maintenance for 
city buildings, for example. So um, I think that we'll have that conversation. I just want to have it contextually with our entire um, capital improvement budget and plans. Um, but I really like, thank you to council member cores and everyone for all of your leadership there thinking through like how much money can we save investing when, right? I think those that's a really important analysis that we should, we should do and we should include um, our other capital projects too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? Sure, so moved. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. <laughs> Can we get a roll call, please? Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Council Member Holstich. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right. Thank you. With that, we will move on to our first uh, public hearing item, which is item 2A. And let me catch up with my notes. Item 2A, an application for the historic designation of the Donald Wexler residence located at 1272 East Verbena Drive. This is an application by Joseph Mantello and Paul Marlowe, owners for a historic designation of the Donald Wexler residence located at 1272 East Verbena Drive. I would like to ask for a staff report. Madam Mayor and members of council, the first public hearing item we have this evening is relative to historic designation of the Wexler residence. Um, you'll give me just a moment, so I'll get the PowerPoint started here. In terms of the residence itself, it was designed by Donald Wexler in 1954, construction finished in 1955, and it served as the family residence until 1989. Uh, one of the things that's perhaps unique about the residence is that Mr. Wexler designed it to be expandable. And so that as his family grew, uh, it was added onto or rooms were subdivided inside the residence itself. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, Donald Wexler is one of our local architects of some renown. Uh, he was responsible for the design of the Palm Springs Airport Terminal Building, also the Dinah Shore residence, the Alexander Steel Houses, the seven steel houses on the north end of town, and with his partner, the Royal Hawaiian Estates, among many other residences here in Palm Springs and the Coachella Valley. In terms of the residence itself, the original 1954 residence was a two bedroom, two bath residence of 1400 square feet. As I mentioned, he did design the residence to expand with the growth of his family and it does include an addition in 1968 that added additional bedrooms and a bathroom onto the rear of the residence, uh, but it mirrors the post and beam style of the original portion of the residence. Here we have images, uh, the original sketch of the residence on top. The photographs in black and white are pictures of the residence when the Wexlers lived in the home, and then the colored photographs are pictures of the residence today, you can see that the appearance uh, is pretty much almost exactly the same as when the family lived there. In terms of the criteria for consideration of historic designation, the Historic Site Preservation Board found that the residence met four of the criteria uh, necessary for designation. Uh, in addition, they also reviewed the residence for integrity and found that uh, the residence does merit designation as a class one or landmark structure. And so voted unanimously to recommend approval of the designation. Uh, with that, that concludes my presentation to you, Madam Mayor. I believe that we have Mr. Stephen Keelon who prepared the nomination report available as part of the public hearing and staff is also available to answer questions that you might have about this designation. Thank you. Uh, are there questions for uh, uh, Flynn or for Mr. Keelan? Uh, not being any questions, I, I will make offer a comment that uh, one of the joys of being on the Palm Springs City Council is uh, 
many of these historic designations that come before us because it's just a, uh, a history lesson uh, every time you get a chance to look at some of these incredible homes that have uh, been a part of our community, the history behind them and uh, uh, with uh, being able to see Donald Wexler's uh, home, that was a treat. So with that, if there were no questions, we. I would like to open the public hearing. The applicant will have up to five minutes to provide their testimony and the public is invited to speak on this public hearing item for up to two minutes. If there are other speakers, the applicant will be invited to provide a rebuttal of up to two minutes. Uh, does the applicant wish to speak on this item? Uh, Mr. Keelan will be uh, serving as the applicant, uh, representing the applicant and uh, he's just connecting his audio now. Mr. Keelan, welcome to uh, City Council once again. We see you're trying to connect, so we have patience. Hi, can you hear me yet? Now we can hear you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, considering this this evening. I don't really have a lot to say because the staff report was so complete. Um, but I just wanted to convey that the owners of the house are, oh, are you able to hear me? Okay. So I just wanted to let you know that the owners of the house are fully in support of this as is Palm Springs Preservation Foundation. And so I'm getting feedback. Uh, we're having difficulty. Yeah, no, I'm okay. And so I just wanted to say how, what a great uh, opportunity and honor it was to work on this nomination. I really enjoyed learning more about it um, and how interesting it is to have a house designed by the architect for himself and his own family. Um, and so well designed that he, you know, had the foresight to be able to add on to it without really um, disturbing the original design too much. And, you know, he raised his family there. And then when it was restored by Lance O'Donnell several years ago, he was a consultant on that. So it has a lot of integrity. Um, it's a beautiful house. So unless there are any other questions, I think that's all I had to say. All right. Uh, Mr. Mejia, do we and have any other public comments? Madam Mayor, there's no other public comment. All right. Uh, there being no other speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from council? Uh, is there a motion? I'll move it. A second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Councilmember Holstech. Yes. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right, thank you. Mr. Keelan and to the owners, thank you. Item 2B, City Council consideration of the decision of the Planning Commission to continue discussion to a date uncertain of the zone text amendment case number 51 or 5.1547 ZTA relating to development standards for warehouse fulfillment centers. I'd like to ask for the staff report. Madam Mayor and members of council, our next public hearing item is relative to a zone text amendment that was considered by the planning commission and has been called forward for discussion by the city council. With that, the request is relative to modifying certain development standards for the 
uh, M2, I'm sorry, can you all see the presentation? Not yet. For some reason, my screen share isn't working. Let me try that again. Okay. There you are. There it is. So the proposal is relative to modifying the standards for the M2 or manufacturing zone and then the EI or energy industrial zone. Uh, those zones lie primarily north of the Interstate 10 freeway. I do have a map. I'll go to that in just a moment. The zone text amendment, just by way of history, was prepared by staff. Over the last uh, couple of years, we've had a number of pre-applications with developers who are interested in doing distribution or fulfillment centers. And some of the issues that they kept on bumping up against were our height restrictions and our parking requirements. So while the use is allowed and to the scale that's anticipated, the issues are really relative to our existing zoning regulations for height and parking. In terms of the location of the M2 and the EI zones, this is a map showing the area around the intersection of the Interstate 10 Freeway and North Indian Canyon Drive. The M2 zone is shown in the purple color, and then the EI zone is shown in the blue color. Uh, you'll notice the M2 zone is north of the freeway. There is a portion of the EI zone that does extend south of the freeway to the railroad line. In terms of the centers themselves, this is just a depiction of what a standard distribution or fulfillment center might look like. Uh, this comes from one of the pre-applications that we had conducted uh, sometime last year. But essentially what it involves is a large building. These could be anywhere from about 200,000 square feet up to over a million square feet. Primarily, they do have access for loading docks on two sides of the building. Uh, in this particular case, you'll see docks on the long side of the building, uh, both the, uh, in this case, the upper and the lower side of that drawing. And then surrounding the building itself will be parking spaces for employees. Uh, they'll also have areas for landscaping and retention around the perimeter of the site. So typically these buildings are centered in the middle of the site to allow for access along all four sides of the building. In terms of the modifications proposed by staff and presented to the Planning Commission at their November 17th meeting, Relative to height, we proposed a modification to the existing height limit in both the EI and the M2 zones. The standard height limit in those zones currently is a 30 foot limit. It does allow for buildings up to 40 feet with additional setbacks from the property lines. What staff had proposed in consultation with the uh, developers who were looking at bringing those centers here to Palm Springs was to keep the 30 foot base limit and then allow up to 60 feet or up to 95 feet, uh, dependent upon meeting three qualifications. Number one, both the 60 and 95 foot limits would have additional setbacks. The 95 foot limit would obviously have a greater setback than that of the 60 foot height limit. Uh, secondly, they would need to be a minimum of 1,000 feet away from the I-10 freeway. So any building over 30 feet in height would need to be more than 1,000 feet away. And then finally, we imposed minimum parcel size based on either the 60 or the 95 foot height limit. Uh, just again, based on the fact that these would require additional setbacks. Uh, with the additional setbacks, they would require a larger size parcel. In terms of the thousand foot buffer from the freeway, uh, this map shows you in the gray area, which is uh, a thousand feet from the I-10 freeway right of way. Uh, it shows you where the buildings would not be permitted. So anywhere within that gray zone uh, that follows the I-10 corridor, any building over 35, 30 feet in height would not be permitted within that gray zone. And so that disqualifies much of the area south of the freeway from any building over 30 feet in height. In terms of the height and why it may be necessary, 
there are two primary systems that are currently in use for distribution centers and fulfillment centers. Uh, there's a system called the narrow aisle racking system, which is primarily used for distribution centers in terms of storing merchandise for distribution to stores within the region. Uh, because of the equipment that is used, uh, that being a forklift and the maximum height that the forklift can reach, as well as fire protection requirements, uh, this requires a building height of about 55 to 60 feet. And so that's kind of the limit for this type of a system, primarily used for distribution centers. Fulfillment centers, which are those uh, primarily for mail order or, sorry, mail order, um, <laughs> internet orders uh, uh, for companies such as Amazon and other type of uh, internet delivery systems. Uh, there isn't really a height mandated by the structural system. What is being proposed by our ordinance is a 95 foot height limit. They use a mezzanine racking system with multiple levels within the building itself. Uh, and so that is what is requested under the proposal. In terms of modifications to parking requirements, what we are looking at is modifying our current requirement for such facilities from one space for every 800 gross square feet of floor area to a parking requirement that decreases as the square footage increases. There's a couple of reasons for doing that. Number one is the environmental issues. Uh, I believe that we've had a discussion before that unused uh, parking lot areas uh, generate to the urban heat island effect. So that has an impact on uh, warming here in the local area. There's also issues relative to stormwater runoff. Uh, but then also with the specific needs of these facilities, typically the uh, employees per square foot reduces as the building square footage increases. And so there's a need to have a parking requirement that is tailored to these types of uses. Staff did look at other communities where the distribution and fulfillment center use is much more common. Uh, and modeled our requirements similar to those used by other communities. In terms of the Planning Commission action and consideration of this item, it was considered at their November 17th meeting. We do identify in our staff report the issues that were addressed by the Planning Commission uh, during that meeting. Uh, we also provided a link to the discussion, which is available on video, uh, if there's anyone who wanted to review that. Some of their concerns relative to the development standards uh, primarily were related to height, that there wasn't a consensus on the increase in height. However, the Planning Commission did support the parking revisions for the use as proposed. There were also a number of concerns relative to the environmental impacts in terms of the traffic impacts, air quality impacts from the truck traffic specifically, uh, impacts to the habitat uh, in the specific area, impacts to the aquifer, and then visual impacts of the buildings themselves. There was also a concern relative to the location of such facilities. The Planning Commission uh, did reach consensus, consensus that such facilities should not be located south of the I-10 freeway, and that primarily relates to its proximity to the whitewater conservation area and any potential impacts to our aquifer here in the Coachella Valley. In terms of scale and massing, uh, there were also concerns raised about the height of the building, the massing of the building. Um, and so based on those concerns, the Planning Commission uh, voted four to three to continue the item to a date uncertain, directing staff to do additional research. The item, as you're aware, was called forward to City Council for consideration. And what we have in our package for you this evening is the uh, zone text amendment, as was uh, uh, presented to the Planning Commission on November the 17th. Uh, I will suggest that perhaps there are some additional considerations that you might discuss this evening based on some additional input that we've received from members of the public. Uh, and those would be related to height and the location of such facilities that perhaps 
it should be limited to a more defined area, and I'll present a map with that in just a moment. Uh, one of the other things that was suggested is that in addition to the changes to the parking uh, requirements that we're proposing, that we should add language to allow applicants to submit a specific parking plan, which is a process that's already defined in our zoning code, uh, to tailor parking requirements specific to the use. So again, trying to right-size parking based on the varying needs of distribution centers and fulfillment centers. And then one of the other things that staff might recommend to you, and this would be for a later discussion, is that you might consider operational standards added to Chapter 5 of the Municipal Code relative to fulfillment centers. Um, the reason I suggest that is just based on some of the research we've done as this has been implemented in other communities, things that address insurance requirements for delivery vehicles and similar operational standards. Again, this is not an item that needs to be discussed this evening, but the city council may want to consider that at a later date. Let me just talk about limitation on the height to a specific area. Uh, in doing some further research based on input that we've received, a lot of the area in the EI or energy industrial zone is under long-term leases to wind energy facilities. And so based on that, those areas are highly unlikely to ever have some type of a distribution or fulfillment center. So what we might recommend to you to consider this evening is limiting height to a more limited area, which I show on the left, which would be a portion of the M2 zone north of 19th Avenue and to the west of Indian Canyon and a portion of the EI zone also north of 19th and to the east of Karen Avenue. And I have some proposed language if you're interested in discussing that, that we could easily amend the ordinance that you have before you this evening, should you wish to limit that to a more specific area. With that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my presentation to you this evening. Happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I know there will be a number of questions. Uh, if I could ask one question right at the start, though, uh, before we move on. Uh, Flynn, could you define for us uh, specifically what are the decisions that City Council needs to make this evening? So in terms of the decision before the city council this evening, we have advertised this as first reading of an ordinance. And so the decision is relative to uh, proceed with the ordinance on first reading as is drafted and as you might amend this evening. Um, two of the things that I would suggest relative to amendment would be looking at the limited height area. I'd like to get your input on that. And then secondly, just the uh, limited language that I propose relative to allowance for a specific parking plan for these types of facilities. And that's a relatively easy add to the ordinance itself. So those are really the only two additions that we'd be looking for to the ordinance as drafted. Great, thank you. Uh, I see council member Kors. Thank you. Uh, so the limited um, height area, that last map you showed us, um, and I, we've emailed on some of this and talked on some of this, but I just want to try and understand this and uh, the public does. The issues regarding habitat and the aquifer, were those, those would not be in that, those were south of the 10? That's how I understood it, but I want to clarify that. That is correct. The issues relative to protection of the aquifer really lie south of the I-10 freeway. And the area that we're proposing is to the north of the I-10 freeway. Uh, in fact, in most cases, it's 12 to 1,500 feet away from the I-10 freeway to the north of it. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, another question that just went out of my head, but I'll move to my third one, which is probably more for um, maybe the city manager. But I know these sort of fulfillment centers have different uh, sales tax implications than um, I knew until um, I started looking into this. And so um, I know staff's been working to get us estimates based on what other cities bring in from something similar. So uh, city manager, do you, are you the one who's has that hopefully? 
Yeah, I can offer some perspective. You know, it's 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 hard to say exactly. We've seen some parallel examples where annual tax collection for the standard 1% tax is as much as 40 million and we would estimate annually, we would estimate conservatively 20 to 40 to to be cautious at the outset not knowing the scope and scale of, you know, and which would really depend on the applicant, uh, but the revenue can be significant. Um, property tax too, while not nearly uh, on that scale, is also probably uh, in the millions, but more like one to two million dollars uh, minimum uh, for property tax valuation. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And if I think of my third question, I will um, raise it now or I'll raise it later, but I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council Member Woods. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Flynn, for the, the discussion. I'd like to go back to the city manager just a second, if I could. Um, you know, when we make land use decisions, um, some, some land uses pay for themselves and the services that a city provides to them, fire, police, roads, all of that. And, and some land uses do not, and they have to be subsidized. Uh, and, that's, and so what we try and do when we look at land use is balance those out so that we have, um, th that we have services for both of them. You just explained that the potential of, of changing the land uses for this particular area that uh, Flynn had just laid out would have implications to raise revenue for the city. Can you just further explain that? I know we have a 1% tax, a sales tax, but how does that work? If, if, uh, if, if it's a distribution center like an Amazon or, or, or something of that nature that you're distributing right to the consumer is probably different than if you're just a distribution center sending it to stores. And I would assume that's a different, a different, and we, we can't define at this point what it would be. So I'm just curious what those economics would look like. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And really looking at economic impact gets somewhat complicated because you tend to also want to look at the jobs that are provided when you look at land use and you're talking about economic impact, as well as lots of other things uh, environmental impact, you know, impact on aesthetics, you know, good fit. So you really do, I think, want to look at this holistically, but you're absolutely right. A sales tax generating business is, is functions much differently from a business that wouldn't have that same uh, sales tax component. Um, and again, I mentioned jobs. Uh, a lot of economic development theory is based on the idea that if you grow wealth in a community, it's the demand from people with those larger paychecks that also support your tax base, right? You need both. You need people selling something, but somebody selling something without somebody buying isn't worth that much. And so I really do think you want to look at the entire picture, the highest and best use of the land, uh, the, the type of jobs that are most likely to be offered through some sort of distribution center, as well as the revenue collection for the city. So in this case, you know, um, we know the distribution centers don't, there, there are some jobs that are high paying, but a lot of the jobs are, are not so high paying, but we have that's balanced obviously by, um, it, there's a potential for an enormous amount of revenue that comes off of it. Um, and I'm just, and since we can't define what type of distribution center it is in making this decision, um, I am not clear how the law works um, for how we capture the revenue. I'm right. Sure. So I think uh, we can clarify the law a little bit, and Jeff Ballinger might be able to offer a little more than I can in that regard. Um, but you're absolutely right. Just like other land use situations, sometimes you might have a commercial designation, and it could be a retail store that levies property, to, uh, sorry, a sales tax, or it could be a, a service type of operation that, that doesn't. Both tend to be important because you want you want jobs, and frankly, you want all types of jobs. You would like for more of them to be um, higher wage earning jobs that support people advancing in technical skills or education and those kinds of things. You ultimately need both in a community. When you're talking about land use and you do don't really know what it's going to be, I think it's smart to think about probabilities and possibilities. Think about the positive potential, but also think about uh, any negatives, whether they be aesthetic or, or even um, potential use that might not be highest and best use. And it's really the calculation of all of those things that would probably determine whether you wanna make this kind of change or not. And our city attorney, do you wanna add anything to like um, the difference I explained between distribution to you know, another warehouse and distribution directly to the consumer and how we right. tax on that? 
So under current California tax law, the sales tax um, distribution would be uh, determined based on who owns and operates the facility. So if, it, if the facility is owned and operated by a third party, uh, say not Amazon, um, in that case, the sales tax would be collected by the county and distributed to multiple cities throughout the county. So it's kind of shared throughout the counties. If the property is owned and operated by the company, say Amazon, for example, in that case, uh, all of the sales tax would go to the city in which it's located. So in this case, all of the sales tax would go to the city. Um, uh, in a situation where the distribution center is distributing goods to a retail store, then the sales uh, tax site would be wherever that store is. So if they're distributing um, goods to stores in Palm Springs, as well as Desert Hot Springs, then both of those cities would receive the sales tax based on where those stores are. So it is fairly complex. It also bears noting that that's the current state of the law. There have been recent efforts by some cities uh, to try and equalize all of the sales tax distribution uh, irrespective of where the where the um, distribution center is located. But at least as of today, that's that's where it stands. So from an economic standpoint, um, if I'm listening to you correctly, it would behoove the city financially, just on that level, not all the other multi-tiered levels that we should take into consideration, to have something <coughs> excuse me, that's actually owned by the company, not under, a third party distribution. And under current there, law, yes. Right. And so what I'm wondering is, as we approve that, I, I trying to get in my mind here, um, having worked in land use for a very long time, is there a way to even or do we not to way to even guarantee that or do we not even have that choice here? At least under our current code, we don't have any way of assuring that we don't we don't look at the identity of the owner or the operator when uh, when granting entitlements at this point, uh, I guess, conceivably. The council could um, enact a, a regulatory regime where, whereby uh, only those um, only those operations that are owned and operated by the by the company could get their entitlements and maybe do some sort of a development agreement. But at least under our current ordinance, we don't look at who owns and operates it. Okay, um, I just and I want to disclose that I have had. Um, um, discussions and um, site reconnaissance with uh, Fred Noble, who owns the property, and I've also talked to the chair of our planning commission, <coughs> excuse me, about this issue. So I just wanted to be fully transparent on that. Um, Flynn, <coughs> sorry, how do we limit it? You said you were going to talk about that, but limit the geographic area. <coughs> excuse me. Madam Mayor, if I might. Yes. Yes, this is Teresa. I just wanted to add to um, Council Member Wood's question about if the sales tax revenue goes into the county pool, because there is so much internet sales that has really changed the market, there is a quite a good deal of revenue that is generated through the shared county pool. So while certainly it's better if it's first party owned in your in your city, you still are if it's leased if the property is leased to another uh, party, you still are generating quite a bit of revenue through the county pool. Great, I appreciate that. And then um, Flynn, if you could talk a little bit too, how do we, you know, you talked about if we wanted to limit it to a geographic area and you show two maps, could you just go in, you said you could explain how you might do that. Absolutely. So what I would propose, if you do want to limit it to a specific geographic area, we would add text to the zone text amendment that addresses that. And so for the M2 zone district, the language that I would propose to add would be as follows, is a section that states, uh, buildings over 40 feet in height shall only be permitted within the area bounded by 18th Avenue on the north, Indian Canyon Drive on the east, 19th Avenue on the south, and the western boundary of the zone district to the west. In the EI zone, we would add similar language under the height uh, section of the code that states that any buildings over 40 feet in height shall only be permitted within the area bounded by Dillon Road on the north, eastern boundary of the zone district on the east, 19th Avenue on the south, and the Karen Avenue right of way on the west. And so it's the addition of that language that defines that limited area within the M2 zone and the EI zone. 
And so that's the way I would propose that if you choose to do that, uh, that's the way that we could limit the area for buildings over 30 feet in height. And that was the recommendation of the Planning Commission, correct? Um, it was not the recommendation of the Planning Commission. Uh, they didn't come to consensus on the issue of height. Uh, however, further input that we received uh, both from members of the Planning Commission and members of the public uh, have helped us to come up with that limited area. Great. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I will reserve comment for later. All right. Uh, I think Councilmember Garner, or excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Garner has questions. Thank you. Um, I actually don't have a, a question as much as I just wanted to add to that um, discussion about the, the law, um, because I wanted just to remind all of us that the League of California Cities um, voted on this and we supported it in because they are actively trying to change the law um, so that these taxes from these fulfillment centers are more equitable, equitably distributed. And, and we as a council voted on that at one of our meetings to sign on to that. Um, obviously, that doesn't necessarily go either way with how we're having this discussion, but just so that everyone's on the same page, um, that the law, um, as it currently stands, would give more taxes to this city, potentially, but then that could that could change um, if those lobbying efforts um, happen. If I could add, uh, last year I chaired the League of California Cities Revenue and Taxation uh, Committee, and uh, this issue of how uh, sales tax is distributed was uh, uh, very heavily uh, debated. Uh, ultimately, on the action that was taken by uh, uh, the committee was to refer this matter back to uh, the committee uh, that uh, this year is being chaired by uh, Norma Martinez Rubin from the city of Pinole uh, and to hopefully uh, develop recommendations that would uh, go to the city managers uh, group to uh, further elaborate. It was extremely contentious uh, debate uh, that took place uh, at the League of California Cities. Um, and without trying to speculate too much, it is going to be ex very, very difficult uh, to find consensus among cities as uh, the differences in sales tax revenue from one city to another is absolutely enormous. Forgive me for jumping in on that. Uh, are there other questions for staff? Uh, I have uh, a couple of questions back uh, to uh, uh, this. To well, let me start with Flynn. The area that you are describing that we might limit the height requirement to. Uh, is does that area fully incorporate the uh, proposed uh, centers that are under consideration? I just want to clarify that the meetings that we've had were for proposed facilities, but no applications, no formal applications were actually submitted. Uh, it does incorporate sites that uh, members of the public have inquired about for the construction of fulfillment centers, distribution centers. So yes, it does incorporate that. All right. And the area that is to the west of that, that you're proposing that we not extend uh, the height requirement to it uh, at this time, that's because there are existing long-term uh, wind contracts on, the, on that site. That is correct. And so we don't foresee those being used uh, in the near future based on the length of the contracts for fulfillment or distribution centers. So if we were to move forward with a with the limited amount of uh, area that you're talking about today, uh, does that foreclose us from uh, adding uh, other areas at a later date uh, at the higher height? No, it does not. Just like the zone text amendment before you this evening, you do have the ability as a city council in the future 
to amend your zoning code to allow this in an expanded area should you choose to do so. Right. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions for the city manager. Uh, were we able to, uh, in looking at other cities that have facilities similar to what's being contemplated here, uh, been able to define uh, specific uh, records of the additional sales tax that has been generated in those cities? Yes. Yeah, so the estimates that I provided earlier in the reference to approximately $40 million came from real anecdotal cases of actual cities tax collection. Okay. Is this one or two cities or is there numerous cities that uh, this is the case? I, I think consistent with this discussion before about the right scenario where you have a, a first party, so to speak, business located, um, that would be anecdotal and, and somewhat generalizable. Again, the scope and scale of a project certainly matters, and we haven't been exhaustive in our research, but that is not an attempt to pick you know, a community that we thought had the highest tax collection, but rather one that we thought was analogous to the type of development we think we might see here. And to uh, get a sense of, uh, of uh, comparison, uh, at $40 million, what's our current sales tax that we're collecting each year? Um, I, boy, I'd have to look to, to get the exact number, but that would probably be in the same ballpark of $40 million. So we're talking about the potential to double the amount of sales tax that is collected in the city of Palm Springs. I'd want to go back and verify numbers, but that puts it in the right perspective. This is not um, a discussion of small adjustments in, in revenue. It would be to collect $40 million annually in sales tax would be a game changer for the city's finances. Have yeah, we had any project come before us uh, in, in any... Any of the members of staff can answer this question that has the potential for this kind of revenue change. Is you know, collection is you know roughly forty million or or somewhere in that neighborhood, um, and sales tax is our most significant source of revenue. Um, it's unlikely that there's ever been a single development that could offer anywhere close to that kind of um, tax collection on its own. Thank you. Are there any other, uh, council member Halsage, yes, I see. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I just have a question as a follow-up, Flynn, about the parking and the heat island effect. Um, and so, for example, I see on page 37 of the packet, um, which is the staff report for the planning commission. So it goes over how many parking spaces uh, for a million square foot fulfillment center are required in different cities. So it says Fontana, Moreno Valley, Desert Hot Springs, and then it lists the Palm Springs number. So is that under the, cur the current zoning? And then what would be the number under this updated zone text amendment? So in the staff report, uh, the information that's contained in the staff report that went to the planning commission, uh, the number of spaces that we had for Palm Springs is under our current requirement. So for a million square foot facility, that would be 1,250 spaces. When you compare us to cities such as Fontana or Moreno Valley or Colton, you'll see that it's much lower. The Parking ratio that we're proposing puts us somewhere between Moreno Valley and Colton. So it's a significant reduction in the number of parking spaces. One of the things I had suggested was allowing applicants to use a specific parking plan, whereby if they have more automation at the facility and would have less of a need for parking spaces, they could then use a specific parking plan to reduce it even further, which would then open up more area on the site for retention or preservation of habitat. Thank you. So a specific parking plan would allow them to um, have a variance or set a specific number based on the jobs available. Correct. Perfect. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Council Member Coors and then Council Member Woods. Great, thanks. My, my question came back 
to my brain. Um, so when the last time we looked at the height, I think you said was probably 30 years ago in the staff report um, in the 1990s. Did I under, I just wanna make sure I understand. So were there, there weren't warehouses of this type or size or I'm just wondering, I, I don't know that you have a staff report from back then, but what was looked at at that time, I guess is what I wanted to understand that we might not be thinking about. Yeah, no, unfortunately we don't. Um, and just looking at the history of amendments to uh, specifically the M2 and the EI zone districts, we really haven't made any major amendments to that section of the zoning code for gosh, 30 years at least. Uh, development has changed significantly in the industrial sector over those 30 years. And so our zoning code doesn't address the current um, you know, type and, and methods of development. And so it's important that we do an assessment of our zoning code periodically to make sure that we're still in line. At the same time, we also need to uh, be reflective of what type of a community we are, and our own aesthetic goals. And so it's important to take both of those things into consideration. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Woods. Thank you. If I, um, and I don't know if this would go to uh, Jeff Ballinger, Teresa, or city manager, but um, I, I just wanna make sure that we're, it appears that um, if we approve something like this, that there could be a, um, a, 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 a financial benefit to the city and it, it appears to be substantial, but I wanna, make sure that we couch this to the public correctly. When we say $40 million or $30 million in sales tax, that doesn't mean that full amount comes to the city, correct? That is actually split between various entities. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the estimate of 20 to $40 million is based on the 1% standard sales tax that the city would collect. Um, and I and and so we have a couple, you know, uh, Measure J and, and other special sources, but we're not talking about the total tax rate of roughly eight to nine percent that's split among numerous agencies. That would be the city's portion. Right. Thank you. And Flint, do we have um, a definition difference between a fulfillment center, which appears we can get the sales tax from, and a distribution center? Is there a um, a difference in those definitions? We don't distinguish between the two. Um, from a land use standpoint, uh, essentially they're large facilities where goods are stored and then sent out. And so it's difficult from a land use standpoint to distinguish those. From an operational standpoint, uh, you might be able to do that, but from a land use standpoint, uh, I would say they're fairly similar. Because I, and, and how, when I'm in listening to this, it, it seems that we want fulfillment centers. They would be a much stronger benefit to the city than a distribution center, which sends to a store or something. Um, and I don't know if we can add those definitions in and then, and, you know, just modify it tonight a bit or not, if that's doable. Um, think about that for a minute. But the second question is, um, in doing the parking, which I, um, I think is great, um, if we if we build a building and it's automated and we reduce the parking and we do everything for that particular use, that particular use could change um, in the future. And then what happens with the parking if a different use comes in, are they grandfathered in and does that cause a problem for us? What happens when you have a use that changes for a particular property is staff will do an assessment of the change in use. And at that point in time, we, look at what parking would be required and they would either be required to add that on site or take other measures to address a deficiency if there is one. Uh, and that's similar to any type of a change of use, for example, where you change from a retail store to a restaurant where a restaurant requires more parking spaces. Same principle applies. With a warehouse or a distribution fulfillment center, uh, there is a limitation in terms of lot coverage and so the intent is that the portion of the site that isn't covered by building is available for landscaping and parking. Uh, in many cases, just in looking at the examples that I've seen uh, where they aren't building as many parking spaces as our code currently requires, that leaves them more room for landscape buffers and retention. So there is a possibility if the use were to change to a more intensive operation, there would be that area on site that they could incorporate additional parking spaces. And just to go back then, <clears throat> um, are we, 
uh, in the scope of tonight, you know, um, without drawing this out, is, is is it possible to to hone in on a specific use, like a fulfillment center versus a distribution center? I would defer to the city attorney and his earlier discussion uh, about how we might go about doing that. And maybe Mr. Ballinger, if you wouldn't mind perhaps repeating that. Yeah, I mean, we would first want to um, come up with a definition. Uh, I think what we're mostly concerned about is kind of how it's owned and operated, at least under current uh, California tax law. Um, and I think we'd want to incorporate that into the definition and, and perhaps require uh, as a condition of it being allowed a, a development agreement. That way we can kind of tie the use to the land and, and, uh, and the operator. Um, I've seen that done with other, other uses that um, require a little bit of, um, of control uh, from a land use perspective. That would be my recommendation if, if that's where the council wants to go with this. If in discussion, if we decide to do that, is that something we could, you know, we could sketch out tonight and and like we talked about making an amendment about limiting the, the geographic area, is that something we could we could insert tonight? Or is it, is it more complex than that? It's probably a little bit more complex, but you could certainly give us direction to 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 draft that and come back uh, with some some text. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and Mayor, if, if I could, I just want to um, revise a little bit of what I said about the, the tax collection. The $40 million I referenced was closer to the total general fund and Measure J sales tax. Uh, if you just look at the sales tax and the general fund, the revised budget put that closer to uh, 24 million, and it's probably going to close the year um, revised uh, under 30. Measure J will close the year revised a little bit under 20. So putting that 20 to $40 million estimate of sales tax in context, it would likely more than double the general fund source by itself. And uh, since we're talking about impact uh, with a distribution center, which would not necessarily have the same degree of sales tax Im implications for us, uh, what are the property tax implications on uh, a building? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, just thinking about it, um, knowing how property taxes levy based on value, um, but I, I would hesitate to, to say anything. But again, recall that we had estimated that approximately one to two million dollars in property tax associated with the fulfillment center. Obviously, any large commercial building is going to have a high valuation. Um, I'm not sure if there would be significant differences in the two models that would make a material difference in the property tax collected. We'd have to look into that further. Is there any reason to believe that if it was at a million dollars that uh, we would need to expend over a million dollars annually in providing services to uh, a distribution center? I, I think it's unlikely. Nature of uh, the business, um, you know, certainly trucks and things like that have quite an impact on road infrastructure. But you know, proximity to the freeway is an advantage there. Um, so we'd want to look at it a little closer. But I think it's safe to say that um, it would be net ahead for a commercial development of this size, um, probably under almost any conditions. All right. Thank you. Other questions for staff. I see none. So at this time, I would like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing item for up to two minutes. Uh, Mr. Mejia. I'll begin right now. <clears throat> Michael Braun, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you so much. Am I live? Yes, you are. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I am speaking on item 2B, supporting a zone amendment and clarification to allow building heights of up to 95 feet near the I-10 for future fulfillment centers. If Palm Springs residents want to continue to enjoy the highest quality of life and benefit from innovations, we must embrace the future or we will be left behind. 
diversification of our tax revenues has been discussed since 2000. Here is the opportunity to do it right now. Fulfillment, fulfillment centers increase quality of life for our citizens. Same day deliveries, securing tax revenues to pay for our safety, police and fire, clean streets, clean parks, beautiful and significant government buildings, maybe new library, plus entitlements everyone is enjoying and taking for granted these days. Technology is changing the way we live and there's no way to hide. Netflix brought the movie theater to our living room. DoorDash brought the restaurant to our dining room. Peloton brought the gym to our homes. Amazon and with it, fulfillment centers are bringing stores to our doorsteps. Palm Springs is no longer a small village. We're becoming a mini city and must start thinking regional. Small town thinking harms the quality of life for our community and puts our financial well-being at risk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeffrey Bernstein, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Honorable Mayor and City Council, my name is Jeffrey Bernstein, owner of Destination ESP, and I'm urging the council to approve consideration uh, the ordinance to allow for the fulfillment center in Palm Springs. As a small business owner, I'm not a fan of the behemoth online retailers. Palm Springs in particular is unique because of our local businesses. That's a large part of our draw to our tourists and a key to our downtown in particular. That said, the fulfillment center will exist. If it doesn't get built in Palm Springs, it's likely to be welcomed by Desert Hot Springs very close by. The potential to 20 to more than $40 million annually to our city is an opportunity we can't afford to pass up. I'm also the chair of the Measure J Commission, and although I'm not speaking on behalf of the commission, I'm well aware of the significant need and cost for infrastructure improvements to our city. All list of projects to be completed will take decades to fund. However, a fulfillment center's tax revenue could quicken that, vastly improving the lives of our residents. I value our desert landscape environment. However, I think there are ways in which development and preservation can coexist. I would ask that the fulfillment center not be located south of the I-10 and that we work closely with conservationists to ensure the least amount of negative impact. The other important issue is that we as a city must develop new revenue sources. We rely heavily on a select few areas and a fulfillment center could provide almost a third of what our current budget is. The one suggestion I do have is that if this is approved and the revenues are realized, that we earmark some of the revenue to grow our city's economic development department and programs to assist our local businesses. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Gary Keller, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you very much. This is Gary Keller from Lulu, California Beach Room. Comments. Um, basically, I think this new facility that they'll be building is one of the best things that could have happened to Palm Springs. It's going to bring in non tourist dollars that are so really, really important. It's going to be a source of continuing income. It has such good possibilities for growth. Um, there won't be traffic problems. It'll bring in permanent jobs. It'll bring in large construction revenue. And it's certainly a lot better looking than a bunch of ugly gas stations and old foliage and wind-driven sand. We'll get more efficient deliveries in Palm Springs. And it's going to be an excellent piece of property for Palm Springs. And the other piece of the problem is we're talking real money here. We're talking $45 million a year of non-tourist income. And that will take care of a lot of pension funds, a lot of the debts we have currently. And the most important thing is if we don't do it, several hundred feet to the west, it'll go up and Desert Hot Springs will get the income. So it, it's 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 absolutely a no-brainer, and it's one of the nicest things that could have happened. It's way outside the town, and um, I very much recommend the city providing the specific needs and leases and everything else to get that going and keep it 
it's going to be a wonderful thing for Palm Springs, and I appreciate the time to talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jenny Fote, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm, uh, thank you for taking my call. I'm asking you to approve the zone text amendment on 2B. I'm not going to speak on the environmental issues as this project will be subject to an environmental impact report as it goes through planning. So I'm just going to address the height and traffic and what I see as a major impact for us, which is the taxes it will bring into the city of Palm Springs. I um, want us to keep in mind that this facility is located 3,000 feet north of the 10 freeway. So I see little impact on the traffic as it'll be yes, off and be on great. the freeway. There's no housing and very little commercial development in the area. So there'll also be very little impact on the area businesses. Uh, the height of 95 feet is insignificant compared to the 250 to 450 foot height of the windmills that surround that property. Uh, no one's views are impacted. Uh, we have allowed the development of a hotel in downtown, which is over 80 feet. Why wouldn't we allow 95 feet in a commercial windmill area? Near, we're nowhere near any neighborhoods. Um, and as I mentioned, the impact of the tax revenue to the city for this project is whatever the estimate is, we 20 million, 40 million, whatever it turns out to be, it is still very significant. Um, Think of all the streets we could pave, as we talked about earlier, the police we could hire and the homeless services we could provide. I mean, it's just endless what we can do with that with very little impact on any of us here in the city. Think of all the jobs it'll provide. I'll end by calling your attention to the missed opportunities of the past, because I see this fulfillment center as a major opportunity that we don't want to miss. We were supposed to have the outlet malls off the 10th in our city, but we turned them down. Think of the hundreds of millions of dollars they generated. We were supposed to have the Peaker Power Plant on the other side of the freeway, located in Palm Springs. We turned that down. So they moved 100 feet into the county land, and the county has benefited from millions in taxes that should have been going to the city of Palm Springs. So I'm asking you, please don't Ms. make Bo? the same mistake here. Vote to have the Fulfillment Center in our city limits. 3,000 feet north of the freeway. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Noble, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Uh, Madam Mayor and the members of the council, Fred Noble, of Intake Energy. Uh, this is the first step in a long process, but the reality is if you don't take the first step, there won't be a second step. Uh, if the issue is uh, trying to uh, define what sort of use that goes in there, fulfillment or uh, distribution, what you're basically saying is that uh, 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 you, you run the risk of foreclosing a use that would pay a lot of money in an attempt to get the one that will pay vast amounts of money. Either way, they're, they're, you're talking about millions of dollars for the city. This is in a uh, location north of the freeway. Uh, surrounded by windmills, uh, it may go to if it's 100 feet high. You have a 260 foot windmills all around it, and you have 440 foot windmills between it and the freeway. Um, the um, uh, I do urge you to pass the staff's recommendation with the uh, reduced geographic area, which works. Uh, but if you send it back to be studied, or if you send it back to uh, revise what's before you to try to uh, nail down exactly the tax you're going to get, this will go away, uh, and I know it will. And the reason I have a raw nerve about that is I tried to build the Sentinel standby power plant in Palm Springs. It was shot down by the city council at the last minute, and we moved it across the border to the county. And so far, the county has received $88 million in property taxes that should have come to Palm Springs. Um, uh, there's plenty of time to take a look at the environmental issues when it comes to the planning commission. I will tell you that this area has been studied over and over again for wind energy and other uses. 
and uh, there are no uh, uh, biological or archaeological issues here. Uh, it is uh, far from the preserves, uh, and it is in an industrial area. The Mr. only Noble? issue here is to change the height and the parking. Everything else is already a matter of uh, zoning. Mr. Noble, that's your time. We're going to disconnect now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment, and we were able to reach everybody that requested so. Uh, Madam Mayor, you're on mute. Am I back? Yes. All right. I lost the screen and everything there for a moment. Um, there being no other speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Are there any discussion or additional questions from or comments from council? I see council member Kors. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you for the reminder, council member Woods. Um, so as this is a public hearing item, I did have conversations uh, with um, Mr. Noble. I've had conversations um, with Jane Garrison from Oswald Land Trust. And then I've had conversations with numerous people in my role as liaison to the Chamber Hospitality Association and um, at the GM breakfast where there were discussions on this issue. So I wanna make sure to share that um, with the public. Uh, I appreciated all the uh, questions and information shared earlier. Um, and I think the assistant city manager um, had commented, so this is in the question part of, uh, that if it's a distribution center, there would be substantial taxes, but it wouldn't be the same as a fulfillment center. It's possible to just explain that further. Um, I know it's not a land use issue, but I, since I know you had started on that and I wanted to make sure we understood that. So um, I was referring earlier to if, um, and I would ask Jeff to, to help clarify that, the city attorney, but if it is not owned by the, like if Amazon does not own the center, then it, it and it is leased, then the taxes go into the county pool and are shared within, with the cities in the county jurisdiction but it still is a tremendous source of revenue to the city nonetheless. So I, I just didn't want you to think that it is not a worthwhile model. It still does generate considerable revenue for the uh, tax sharing. Obviously as more and more um, sales goes over internet. And I would just echo that it's not so much a matter of what it's called, whether distribution or fulfillment, it's, it's how it's operated, how it's owned and operated. That, that's helpful. Um, thank you. And just some uh, brief comments. Some were covered uh, in comments, but I think there have been numerous um, times the city in its history before any of us were on council has had opportunities to do things north of the 10. Um, I think starting with the windmills that were said no to that then got pushed into county land and then the city finally annexed the land back. Um, uh, the outlet malls of the Peaker power plant um, and whether or not I like any of these things in general, um, they all happened anyway and the city lost, you know, clearly hundreds of million dollars of revenue. Uh, and we could all go through how we'd like to see that money spent if we were to get it. Um, you know, housing that's affordable comes to uh, mind, um, but obviously lots of uses if we see that kind of increase. Um, I think anyone who's driven down the 60 or the 10, 210 has seen distribution centers, they are happening. Um, and so I do support uh, doing this. I think we are going to have these, we are going to have the impacts, whether they're here or in unincorporated Riverside County near us or in Desert Hot Springs, um, you know, a quarter mile away or whatever, wherever they may be. And uh, there are probably more coming. 
Um, I do support, you know, keeping them out of the more environmentally sensitive um, areas south of the freeway, as it's been expressed by folks. I think that's really important. And I understand there have been four um, possible projects that have come to the city that were all in a smaller area. Um, and while I'm not necessarily against expanding that down the road, I think starting with a smaller area, um, and if one or more happens, you know, seeing it and deciding if we want to continue um, with more of that or not, I think is, is a smart way to go. Um, but I think allowing the height there and allowing uh, and changing the parking, um, I hope we see more of that, uh, where we have reduced parking and reduced hardscape. Um, and I like the idea of enough buffer with landscaping, which one will make these more attractive and, you know, more, more plants, um, the better, but also um, as council member Woods raised, if there is a different use, have the ability to make changes if in the future, the city wanted to do that. So, um, so I, I support that with the two modifications that uh, the planning director made. Um, and I'm happy to make that a motion if people want a motion on the floor, every mayor is different on this. So um, I'll leave that as my motion if someone wants to second it. If not, we can, either way, we'll continue discussion. I'll second it with discussion. Uh, Council Member Woods, do you wanna start your discussion? Um, uh, uh, certainly. I also wanna disclose that I also did have a conversation with a potential uh, developer for that site. Um, just, to, I, you know, I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, You know, we, we and I think I mentioned earlier when we look at land use, we really have to look at a total package here. But I think one of the things that we have been trying to do desperately in our city is to diversify our economy. And I think there are many ways to do that: jobs, all kinds of stuff. But revenue is one of those to do things like what uh, Councilmember Core said: build affordable housing or just give us some revenue to do other things. <clears throat> but it's not just revenue alone. Revenue is a huge enticement for um, for a center like this. But when you look at the land use, the location of the property that we're looking at um, seems ideal for this type of use. That's why I seconded this. And the height limit doesn't seem like it will be a problem in this particular area. It's mostly um, across in uh, Desert Hot Springs. There's a lot of cannabis. It's already a lot of industrial and things of that nature. And we need to adapt to our new way of doing business which has been, um, which is through distribution, um, through things like Amazon, et cetera. Uh, and the buildings that we need to basically make that kind of an economy operate are different and need higher height as was explained to us by our planning director. Um, so I think it's a good use and a good location for it. It is also has great access to the freeway without disruption to um, sensitive uses because it's right off the freeway and just to the north. So there's no sensitive uses around that. <coughs> so I think so. I don't think the height is a problem. The parking makes a lot of sense. It's not a problem. Its location seems to be um, very good as well. Um, with all of that in mind, <coughs> the, the added tax revenue and the fact that it will probably cost us less to service this particular property uh, is, is positive. In relationship to concerns I've heard about things like the design of the project and or the environmental impacts. Just to let everyone know, when, when a project comes forward, um, all of that is evaluated. And we have two bodies in our city that evaluates that. We have um, ARC, Architecture Review Committee, and we have the Planning Commission. Uh, and if they hold up anything to what they're doing, which is creating great buildings and great built environment in the city, I have confidence in those two bodies to actually come out with and massage whatever comes to us to be a good product and not just a completely ugly built up, tilt up building with such great height. And then in regards to the environmental issues, you know, lot coverage and, and things of that nature, um, hopefully will all be discussed um, and will have to be evaluated by law when the project actually comes in as an actual project. So with that, I don't see really very many negatives to a project like this, and I see an enormous amount of positives. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, other comments? Uh, Council uh, <clears throat> Mayor Tom Garner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
I, I think this is uh, kind of a frustrating thing, just just for me because I'm not a fan of these fulfillment centers um, generally. But as my colleagues have said, you know, these are whether we like them or not, they're popping up everywhere, and I and I find it difficult to not have some of this potential revenue and jobs in our city um, when we know that they, they'll just spring up right across the way. Um, but that said, I, you know, I really appreciate the planning commission subcommittee and I don't know if others watched, but I, I watched that section of the planning commission and I thought that there was really, um, a lot of great comments made in discussion about what it is that we're looking for. Um, and I understand that some of the comments were probably better suited for us to be having here um, as, as council members, but it, there were a few things that were raised. You know, One of them is that the jobs at fulfillment centers are low wage work. Um, there's also, just what it is that we're trying, what kind of economic development we're trying to support in our city. These are all things that I think are important to, to raise and be mindful of. Um, but when we are looking at this revenue, I, I don't want us to simply say, great, we have this revenue and we can decide later what we want to do with it. Um, I know that we, we can't decide right, right now at this meeting, but I would like to see us actually make a commitment um, and specifically set aside a percentage of that, the money that would come from these type of developments for the people that are doing these jobs. It's the other thing about these fulfillment center jobs is that we know that there's a lot of workers' comp issues. There's a lot of people who go on permanent disability because of this type of work. So I would like to be able to see us as a city saying, we're accepting these jobs here, we're accepting these centers here because it will bring revenue to our city, it will bring jobs to our city, but we're also going to make a commitment to the people that are most impacted by these types of projects um, and making sure that we, yeah, I think affordable housing is a great opportunity, right? You have more low wage working jobs, but then you're in Palm Springs. And I think the last report that came out is that houses are over a million dollars on average. So, and, and rent is, you know, e extremely out of sync as well. Um, so I don't want us to just leave it at this. I'd like to see us actually set aside, make a commitment of a percentage of future revenues to support directly the residents uh, in Palm Springs. Um, thank you. Uh, other comments? I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, well, let me uh, finish then. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Woods, for reminding us. Uh, I did have discussions with uh, Mr. Noble, uh, an extended number of discussions with uh, the chair of the Planning Commission, uh, Kathy Wormack, uh, and have talked about this uh, question with a number of people throughout the community uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, I think this is, uh, I don't know how many, how many years uh, we will be on council, all of us, uh, but I don't believe that any of us will uh, ever see a project come before us that has this much potential economic impact for our city. Uh, this is, uh, uh, and I believe uh, the city manager used the term game changer. It is potentially a game changer. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, could bring a revenue uh, to our city that will give us options that we've not had before at any time that we've been on city council. Uh, whether one is a fan of distribution centers and fulfillment centers or not, they are part of the economy moving forward. I believe the number that I heard uh, during some of my research is that uh, they account right now for approximately 20% of all sales that are taking place uh, in the United States. 
Now that's up from a couple of decades ago when this industry did not exist. Uh, the kind of growth that we can expect to see in the future is absolutely enormous. As we move forward, there's gonna be any number of issues associated with uh, these types of facilities and this type of uh, distribution of sales that's creating some enormous public policy issues uh, that uh, we're gonna struggle on a statewide basis to take and uh, resolve because there is so much money uh, that's at stake. Uh, but the issue that is before us tonight is whether or not uh, we are going to allow these facilities in an isolated area north of Interstate 10, an area that has generated very little revenue for us and that has the potential uh, to generate an enormous amount of revenue. In addition to the construction jobs that will take place as these buildings are being built. Uh, so I am, uh, as enthusiastic in support of uh, this project as I have been for anything that has come before us because nothing has come before us that offers the potential uh, for a change in uh, revenue uh, such as this facility. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other comments from anyone? Uh, Mr. Mejia, I think it's time for the roll call. Councilmember Kors? Yes. Councilmember Woods? Yes. Councilmember Holstech? Yes, and I just need to disclose for the record that I also had conversations with Jane Garrison for Oswit Land Trust, as well as Fred Noble, the owner of the land. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner? Uh, yes, and just to clarify, I did not talk to anyone about this. <laughs> Mayor Middleton? Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right, so it is uh, eight, almost 8.30. Uh, do we want to take a short break before we uh, move on? I saw three heads going uh, in the right direction. That's a majority. It is uh, 8.24. Let's take a 11-minute uh, break and return at 8.35.
Zoning Code Section Chapters 92 and 93 relative to the development standards for the M2 manufacturing and EI energy industrial zones. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next item is our legislative item, and that is number 3A, a request by the City of Palm Springs for adoption of an urgency ordinance to implement Senate Bill 9, requirements for urban lot splits in two unit residential developments. Case number 5.1548 ZTA, four fifths vote required. I'd like to ask for the staff report. Madam Mayor, members of council, the next item on your agenda is an urgency ordinance to implement a recent change in state law. The uh, ordinance, excuse me, let me work on sharing my screen. Sorry, this should be better by now. I should be a pro at this. Um, the ordinance was signed into law by Governor Newsom uh, in September, and it has a January 1st implementation date. So in order to accommodate these regulations, we have proposed an urgency ordinance that's before you this evening uh, to bring those requirements and codify them into our zoning code. In terms of the Senate bill itself, it requires staff approval of the following two things. Number one, the division of existing single family lots into two lots, uh, which is referred to in the ordinance as an urban lot split. And then secondly, to allow the development of two residential units on any existing single family lot. In terms of the urban lot split, as I had mentioned, it does allow for the division of existing single family lots via a tentative map application that is approved at a staff level. In terms of the requirements for urban lot split, it does require that it must have street frontage so that you have vehicular access to uh, the lot. The initial lot must be 2,400 square feet or larger. I'll just make a note here that there are very few lots in the city of Palm Springs that are less than 6,000 square feet. Uh, we do tend to have rather large lot sizes here in the city. Uh, some of our older subdivisions are about 6,000 square foot lots, such as Warm Sands, uh, portion of Movie Colony East, but the vast majority of lots in the city of Palm Springs are 10,000 square feet or greater. Another requirement of uh, the proposed ordinance is that the resulting lots must be approximately equal in size uh, so that there's no more than a 60-40 split. So if you have a 10,000 square foot lot here, as the example in the slide, uh, you could either create two 5,000 square foot lots or you might have uh, something such as a 6,000 square foot lot and a 4,000 square foot lot. There are certain restrictions in order to be able to do an urban lot split. Uh, number one, protected areas, uh, also areas that are either a historic landmark or within a historic district are ineligible. Uh, the urban lot split must not involve the demolition or alteration of protected housing. Uh, and there are a number of situations uh, enumerated in the ordinance which define protected housing. The urban lot split is not available for properties that are to be used as short-term rentals. Uh, it also does require that the property owner occupy uh, the lots that are created for a minimum of three years. Uh, and then also there's a restriction in state law that the city cannot require dedications of right-of-way or off-street improvements such as sidewalks or the installation of curb and gutter as part of the approval of the urban lot split. Associated with the urban lot split is the allowance for two unit development. And so that's allowed on any existing single family lot of record or any lot that's created by an urban lot split. In terms of restrictions, the new units created under the ordinance are limited to 800 square feet in area. However, existing residences 
um, can be maintained at their current square footage. So if you do an urban lot split and you have an existing residence on one of the parcels that's 2,700 square feet in area, that residence can be maintained at its current square footage. On the new parcel, you would be limited to two units of no more than 800 square feet. With the two unit development, there is some reductions in side and rear yard setbacks. Uh, similar to our accessory dwelling unit ordinance, those could be reduced to as little as four feet to accommodate a second unit. And then in terms of parking requirements, it does note that there is a requirement for one space per unit. However, under state law, there are certain reductions that are allowed based on proximity to high quality transit. Just to illustrate exactly what this might mean. So in terms of an urban lot split, there are two different scenarios that I've illustrated for you. The first example is what I'm calling a front back lot split. For this example, I just selected a uh, lot in the El Mirador neighborhood that's approximately 15,000 square feet in area. In terms of a front back split, what you would create is kind of a flag lot situation where there is a portion of the rear lot that extends to the street so that the rear lot does have vehicular access. Uh, the existing house on the front lot could be maintained at its current square footage. And then on the rear lot, uh, you could have two units of up to 800 square feet. Now, one of the things I haven't illustrated is that you could create a second unit on the front lot that most likely would be by dividing the existing single family house and creating a new unit as a duplex, if you will. The other example that I'm illustrating, I just pulled a lot out of the Demuth Park neighborhood. Uh, this is uh, a shallower, wider lot, and so that might be more likely divided as a side-by-side -side lot split. So this particular lot that I'm looking at is approximately 12,000 square feet in area with an existing residence on it. In this scenario, you'd be able to create uh, a lot to the side, which would have two units of up to 800 square feet. It would be a smaller lot of about 5,000 square feet. And then the lot with the existing principal residence would be about 7,300 square feet. In this scenario, in order to make this configuration work, you would need to demolish a part of the existing residence. But this gives you an example of what would be permissible under the proposed ordinance. One of the things that we have in the proposed ordinance is limitation on the new units being no more than 800 square feet. Just to give you an example of what that might mean, typically that would be either a one bedroom or in certain cases, a two bedroom. The illustrations that I'm providing for you this evening are a two bedroom unit and they are rather compact. Um, the reason that we have this restriction is to encourage affordable housing that is built as part of this ordinance. So this is one example, uh, a modular unit or a prefabricated unit from the company Mighty Buildings that's approximately 800 square feet, two bedrooms, one bath. Here's another example of what could be built. Uh, this is a slightly smaller unit, it's 604 suite, 640 square feet uh, that's put out by a company called Honomobo, um, which uh, is another example of, of what would be permissible under the proposed ordinance. Let me talk a little bit about the process for adoption of this ordinance, and um, it's a little bit confusing. We're starting off with the adoption of an urgency ordinance that becomes effective upon your adoption this evening. The reason that we're going the urgency ordinance route is so that we have some regulations in place so that those who are interested in proceeding have some um, specific regulations to follow in terms of beginning with a lot split process. As with any urgency ordinance, we'll then follow up with a regular ordinance. And what we're proposing is to have that first reading on January 27th. That will be a full public hearing. And then to follow with second reading of that ordinance on February the 10th. We would like to take a, a more in-depth look at the proposal in terms of how it might be used to effectively 
um, address the shortage of affordable housing in Palm Springs. And so there are certain things that we'd like to look at in terms of development standards. I think one of the things that we need to do is be more specific in terms of how setbacks are applied for the urban lot split condition and where you're developing a second unit on a property. I think we also want to look at the square footage limitation. We're being very conservative as we start out with 800 square feet. I think what we might look at is a larger unit size, but we want to take some time in doing that. And what I'm suggesting is that we might use a subcommittee of the Planning Commission to investigate how we could effectively use this ordinance to encourage the development of affordable housing. You also received in some uh, last minute public correspondence uh, from um, an architect by the name of Steve Randall, who has some suggestions in terms of how we might modify this ordinance. Uh, they're very good suggestions and something that I think I'd like to forward to the Planning Commission to take a look at as we amend this ordinance in the late spring after uh, input from the Planning Commission. So that concludes my presentation to you. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And with that, Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. I Council Member Coors has got his hand up, so we'll start there. Great, thank you. So Flynn, just to make sure we're clear on this, I think you, a couple of times in the presentation, were noting they can't be more than 800 square feet. And I think it's the opposite. They can't be less than 800 square feet. So in the version of the ordinance that was provided to us by our city attorney, what they're proposing as a template is a maximum of 800 square feet, which also equals the state law. So as I had suggested, what we might want to do is look at expanding that in the future. Right. I would like to take some additional time to study that and see how we might be able to do that um, within our own uh, specific conditions here in Palm Springs. Right. So because you had some 600 square feet one. So what and the city attorney can weigh in. And I know a lot of cities are trying um, to be creative in ways to basically not have any of this housing built by saying it has to be exactly 800 square feet, but that's the minimum. And I know some cities, um, and you know, city attorneys do what cities ask them to, are also saying um, no smaller or no bigger, you know, just uh, to really minimize the impact. But I just wanna, and maybe city attorney can weigh in, um, and I know more of this because the California Coalition, the mayors did a, our entire meeting was on this last week. Um, but um, pulling up the ordinance, the minimum is 800 square feet, right? They don't have a maximum for the square footage of the dwelling unit. Otherwise, you're not building any units families can really live in. I mean, really minimizing the use. So I just want to be clear, and maybe the city attorney can weigh in that that's the minimum, not the maximum under state law. That's, that's the least we could, right? I have the code section up if helpful, Jim. You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, I'm <clears throat> looking at the bill right now, and it, it does say that um, we uh, can't impose uh, standards unless, uh, if they would have the effect of precluding units uh, that are at least 800 square feet. Um, so there, it, it's kind of written in the double negative, and, and so it's a little bit confusing. Um, I'll, I'll look at that and, and confirm. The way the ordinance is drafted, I think it would comply with, with the statute in the sense that we would allow units to, to be built from 500 to 800 square feet. Um, and so I, th I think it would comply with the ordinance, but if the council wants to establish a different maximum uh, or a different minimum tonight, they can, or, or as Flynn suggested, we can take a look at it and see, see what gets proposed and see what's getting built. Yeah, and that, oh, my only concern is can, right? So precluding the construction of two units on either of the parcels or that would result in a unit size of less than. So, so you think it basically allows either less or more because of the way it's written? I agree. I think the drafting it, could be better, but I, I think it does. I, you know, again, if you if you want to allow uh, for larger than eight hundred, you can. If you want to go to a thousand or something close to, to eight hundred, you can do that tonight. 
Okay. Um, you have some other comments, but on this issue, um, I saw Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor Pro Tem. You. Garner, I think, had next. We have lawyers interpret the statute. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I haven't read this, this statute specifically, so I, I can't comment on that part. But um, I do think that we need to be able to have a range because there's lots that are just not large enough to have a bigger a property, right? I mean, I'd much rather that somebody want to divide their property and put up 500 than nothing, right? If that's all that's going to fit. But I... Question for you, Flynn, just so, so that I'm clear. So this is basically saying, you know, if my my parents wanted to divide their property, um, then they would essentially become landlords, or would they be selling the other piece of their property, or could it be either? It could be either. So under the urban lot split, they would be able to divide their property and sell the second parcel to uh, a new property owner who then in turn could develop a unit or two units on that parcel. They themselves would stay in the existing residence. They also have the option of uh, doing a second unit on their property as well. So that's one of the scenarios. Or there is another scenario where they could um, develop a second unit on their property without dividing the lot and in that situation, they would be the landlord. They would be renting that unit uh, to another family. Great, maybe to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, thank you. I just I wanted to be understand how that worked. <laughs> so, just on on my other comment was just I know this isn't you know we're doing this on an urgency basis, which is fine, um, and I think great for planning commission and you to work with some time, um, but just in general direction, at least my thoughts uh, is we wanna see housing come out of this. So we wanna do it in a way that gives flexibility for different sizes and to the extent we can do both bigger and smaller, right? It all depends on the lot size as uh, I think uh, Mayor Pro Tem pointed out. I think that makes sense, um, but giving flexibility on that. Um, I know one city, I think Mowbray has at least one if it's four. Um, need to at least be legally affordable at the 80% of median income, which I think would be great um, if we could look into whether that can be done on this without it resulting in no one wanting to build, right? So we have to just look at how that fits. So that kind of research you've talked about and working on, I think would be really helpful before we adopt a final ordinance, but it is an opportunity to see, you know, more housing, and I don't think we want to do this. We can have design standards. There's a lot we can have in it. I know I've heard from a few residents who think we're going to just get, you know, things that don't at all fit a neighborhood with no design. And um, there are things we can do. It's not, um, but it does require us to allow the extra um, housing in in a lot. So uh, I'd like I'd like you and the planning commission to take the time to bring us back options, but I just want to give my view that I want us to be flexible. Um, and I don't want to do things that are trying to avoid these being built. I'd, I want to do things that'll encourage these being built. Um, and I think that kind of direction is important from council because different cities have different views on this. So, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, council Member Woods. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Madam Mayor. Um, Flynn, uh, you know, the state law has done several things uh, to try and encourage more housing um, at a micro scale. Um, this lot split and two um, that we're looking at tonight and, and two units on a, uh, a one lot is one. But they also just um, recently, not too long ago, uh, ADUs. And just for the benefit of the public, can you talk about the difference in that so the public understands they can still build an ADU? Uh, and this is a separate type of um, legislation. Yes, Council Member Words, you're absolutely correct that we still have our accessory dwelling unit regulations in place uh, that are separate and distinct from uh, either the two unit development or the urban lot split. Uh, and so property owners can continue developing accessory dwelling units under uh, our regulations that we have for that type of, uh, of use. Uh, they can also pursue the urban lot splits or the two unit development. So they're distinct and uh, both can be used depending on whatever the preference of the property owner is. 
So I um, just um, when it comes to the urban form, and I think some of the um, the fears that uh, it appears that uh, constituents have stated to Councilmember Coors about design standards, uh, just on the difference between the two. I don't believe we as a, a, a government have an opportunity to um, put design standards on an ADU. Do we, is that correct? And then do we have the opportunity to do that in this lot split um, two unit scenario? We have limited ability to apply design standards. We can apply what are called objective design standards, where it does not require any judgment in the application of such standards. And so typically what that will mean is that we can require things that the ADU has a similar roof pitch, similar materials and colors, architectural detailing, things like that. But we cannot subject it to an architectural review committee or some type of discretionary process. And so both with ADU regulations and with this two-unit ordinance, uh, there are objective design standards that we can apply, uh, but they have to be able to be done by staff administratively. Um, and so there are some limitations. And do we currently have design standards for ADUs? Uh, we have limited language in our accessory dwelling unit ordinance relative to those types of issues that I just mentioned regarding materials, colors, roof pitch, et cetera. And this urgency ordinance would not add that to these new units? There's, there's some very basic language. One of the things that we do want to look at with the planning commission is just in order to resolve some concerns about changes to neighborhood character is just making sure that we have language, that there's consistency and that these new units will blend in with existing housing types. And I would encourage um, that discussion, you know, um, in this whole, um, in the discussion of both ADUs and, and you know, uh, lot splits, that that take place. Um, the example you gave in your um, presentation with the modular units are very high end, and that's not necessarily what's going to be built. Uh, that's true. It's just trying to monetize their property uh, they're not going to build something like that. So I think it's really important. Can you tell us, you know, in your presentation, you went through uh, a variety of criteria. What is our at our discretion tonight? Uh, what is state requiring and what is at our discretion that we're approving tonight? I would keep it fairly simple in terms of the, how you might modify this urgency ordinance. One of the things you've mentioned is the square footage limitation. If you wanted to increase that tonight, I'd recommend staying fairly conservative, I'd say 1,000 or 1,200 square feet, um, just to begin with, with the idea that we, with the Planning Commission, will look at what we might do to accommodate family housing um, without getting into the concern that we're creating many mansions in people's backyards. Uh, so square footage is one of the things you can look at. Uh, things such as height and setbacks, those are governed by state law. I wouldn't recommend that you do that now, um, as well as parking. And so any modifications you might make this evening, I'd probably limit it just to the square footage uh, and wait until later this spring once the Planning Commission has been able to fully vet this and how it may apply to the specific conditions in Palm Springs. Uh, that you take uh, additional measures. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Council, uh, Council Member Colstich. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with, with all that's been said, especially the sentiment that we very much want to encourage uh, this housing, as Mayor Pro Tem said earlier, uh, the average single family home is over a million dollars in the city of Palm Springs. It's extremely unattainable 
for um, young people, working people, families, uh, seniors on fixed incomes, um, people we want to retain in our city and also recruit. So um, we've done this a few times now, a little bit with the ADUs, for example, and uh, the state opening that up and then us um, going above and beyond. But I think that community outreach is going to be incredibly important and working with our consultants and with planning commission to think through um, how to so one sort of the balance of what council member Woods was saying in terms of design standards and um, having high expectations for some of this with the balance of um, developing affordable housing um, or affordable or attainable housing for folks. So one, I want to balance those interests. And then two, I'd love to think through, you know, what's the community education that we can do to really see, we want this to, these housing policies to result in new housing. And I think that's the um, failure that we're seeing at local governments, right? These policies aren't always translating into um, more housing units at the scale that we need to solve the deep housing crisis that we are in. So um, I know that uh, our director uh, um, and our planning commission and consultants and the council can figure that out for us um, as we use this law to our advantage to really uh, spur housing development and get these units. Because like Mayor Pro Tem said, many of us want units like this. And this is a huge opportunity, um, especially as we hopefully have a COD campus in our city and we will have student housing and that sort of thing. So thank you for all of your work. It was really excellent um, presentation and staff report. Um, and I'm proud to support it and looking forward to the um, harder policy work that is to come. Uh, Flynn, uh, question for you. Uh, this new uh, ordinance will apply to bare land. Am, am I correct? So if we're talking about uh, a multi-acre project, uh, uh, does this not reduce down the size of lots that can be uh, built on? No, it doesn't. It applies to existing single family lots of record. So okay. it applies to lots that have already been subdivided and created. Uh, raw land would be subject to the city's regular zone districts. Okay. Um, we have everything from R1A to R1E, so ranging from 5,000 square feet in size up to 20,000 square feet in size. Okay. Um, but this only applies to existing. So all of that work that you and so many others on the Planning Commission did in terms of the small lot ordinance, that still remains in effect? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I must tell you, one of my concerns moving forward with this is that uh, if we're building on new construction, much smaller lots, that what we're likely to end up with is far more additional second homes as opposed to the kind of housing that I think was envisioned and hoped for out of SB9. So. Uh, I'm going to support uh, moving forward uh, with this, uh, but I do want to express uh, that I've heard from colleagues up and down the state of California uh, that uh, frequently fall into two camps. Those who uh, see this as uh, uh, the solution to the housing problems uh, that we've had in California and that hundreds, thousands of new units are going to be built. And those who uh, believe that the sky has fallen in on the state of California and uh, single family housing as we have known it for the last uh, uh, 100 years is going to come crashing to an end. Uh, and frankly, I'm skeptical of both. Uh, so one of the things that I would ask is that, uh, as we implement this, we track very carefully how many units are actually being built. The goal here is to build more housing. Uh, and I'm gonna put it out on the record right now. I don't think this bill is going to result, however well-intended it was, in a significant number of new housing being built in the state. I hope I'm wrong. 
and I hope we get the numbers that prove it, but I would like to see the numbers uh, developed over time that demonstrates whether or not uh, the incredibly good intentions behind SB9 uh, bear fruit. Uh, council member Corris. Yeah, I, th I think the bill's author and the estimates for 800,000 over a decade. So it's not gonna solve our housing crisis, but um, it will take away a lot of the nimbyism that keeps housing, multifamily housing from being built. That's one of the concerns and equalizes it among cities. So there are not a handful of cities like ours who want, want more housing and others who don't. But um, I, I don't think anyone, including the author, thinks this is gonna, this alone is gonna solve our housing crisis. It's just one of many pieces that we're all gonna need to see. Um, and, you know, 10 years from now, we hope, it's been effective. Um, and I think we'll see more bills from Sacramento to try and solve the problem. And, you know, the people who others are trying to do a ballot measure to overturn it and say local governments get to decide everything on housing and it's not a state issue. So we'll see how that all goes. In the meantime, um, I'd like to move this item, but I would like to suggest we change. Um, it's a public maximum. hearing. We, have, we can't move it yet. We haven't heard from the public. Isn't this a public hearing? Oh, this is a public. No, it's legislative. And this is oh, legislative. It's legislative. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, uh, but then we increase to up to a thousand, as I don't want us to rush to bring this back, right? And um, so I don't want us to go too big right now, but I'd like us to see a little bigger than sort of that 800 level to a thousand if um, the rest of council supports that. I'll second that motion. Council Member Woods. Um, you know, I just want to um, uh, re I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Urban Forum. Um, obviously, somebody's decision, uh, if you own a lot, to do this is going to be based upon an economic gain. They're going to gain something from it, and they're going to see an economic advantage to doing it. Um, and I don't think. Um, just because it's being thrust upon us, I do not think we should capitulate um, on our design standards at all. You know, we've seen chalk come forward um, with great housing that was being built that's low income. We have seen um, um, the Allo project, which is on Palm Canyon and Stevens, which is great design come forward. We are a city that is known for its design standards and its architecture. And if somebody isn't kind of, if we don't hold the feet to somebody's fire to build a good product as a second unit, um, as, the, as the planning commission goes through this and the ARC goes through this, we won't get it. And we'll change the character of our neighborhoods. I don't think density is not an issue. Adding the units is not an issue. I just want to make sure that as we go forward with the review of all that, that that is um, forefront in our minds. Um, to do it because it still allows housing, but it allows good housing uh, and it allows housing that has a good urban form. I will uh, reluctantly vote to, uh, to approve up to a thousand. Uh, is there any other further comment? We have a motion and a second then. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Coors. Yes. Councilmember Holstech. Yes. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Count Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Motion passes five to zero, and I'll read the uh, ordinance title and urgency ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Springs, California, amending Chapter 9.62 of the Palm Springs Municipal Code and Chapter 93.00 of the Palm Springs Zoning Code relating to urban lot split and two unit projects and determining the ordinance to be exempt from CEQA. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is uh, 9, 12, and we try to target nine o'clock for getting uh, our additional public comment. Uh, as I understand it, we only have one uh, individual who wants to give non-agenda public comment. Uh, Mr. Mejia, can we uh, make that phone call? We'll do.
David Feltman, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Okay, good evening again, Mayor, Mayor for Tampa, City Council, and staff. Um, I'm calling because I wanted to request an update for the community on the naming of a permanent replacement for the Director of Parks and Rec. Um, it's my understanding that that position has been open since September 3rd. We're now into January, obviously. Um, and I was reading with some excitement the strategic plan and the PowerPoint with the four columns, which includes in the third column, community infrastructure. And as we all know, parks and rec and community infrastructure are um, almost one and the same. Um, this is something that is used to these facilities or something that are, that are used heavily by our citizens of all types in the city, um, by our visitors. And the absence of a permanent director, I think, is really a serious concern, particularly as we enter the budgeting process. As we know, it takes quite a bit of um, research, due diligence, um, planning to, to make infrastructure improvements, let alone new projects that require infrastructure development. And I would just hope that we could get an update for the community on when this uh, position will be named. Thank you very much. The person will be named for this position. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment. All right, thank you. With that, we will move on to new business. And the first item is number 5A, uh, approve a resolution authorizing a joint application with the County of Riverside for operation, or excuse me, for home key to funding. I'd like to ask for the staff report. Jay, welcome. Well, uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. Uh, the item uh, before you is a request to have the City Council adopt a resolution uh, for a joint application with the County of Riverside for Home Key 2 funding. The use of these funds will go towards the development of a new homeless navigation center at 3589 McCarthy Road. Partnering with the county on the application provides several advantages. The county's qualifications and experience with building and operating residential properties. Uh, they've provided healthcare and behavioral health service. And all this increases the potential amount of points that the city county application may receive. In addition, the county will be providing funding for the purchase of this property in the amount of $5.9 million. And the county will also provide an additional 1.1 million to be used towards capital improvements and renovation costs of the facility. Though uh, those uh, terms and conditions will be brought forward at the next council meeting in the form of a memorandum of understanding and funding agreement. Uh, so as you can see, uh, or as you may know, additional funds are needed to cover the cost of capital improvements for services and property management. So one potential source of funding are the Home Key 2 funds that were recently allocated by the state in the amount of $1.45 billion to address homelessness throughout the state. The application for the Home Key funds requires that the city uh, council adopt a resolution authorizing a joint application and participation in the home key funding program. Uh, now, the staff report also provides updates on other activities related to the navigation center. And uh, I just wanna let you know that uh, last month, uh, staff released a request for letters of interest from potential service providers. Those service providers would be responsible for operating the navigation center uh, managing a commercial kitchen and dining room, providing wraparound services, 
managing or subcontracting with medical and dental uh, providers and behavioral health services. Those letters of interest are due back to the city tomorrow. So we don't know uh, who uh, will have submitted or who uh, may uh, be a likely candidate to be the operator of this property. And in regards to community outreach, uh, our consultants who are also on the line here um, will initiate a community outreach plan to solicit ideas and suggestions on the navigation center and operations. And that plan is attached to your staff report. So you can take a look at that and see what's available here. They would hope to achieve consensus on the design and uh, gain stakeholder feedback and input on what other types of services the community may need, how the operations of the center uh, should, should be managed, and any other concerns or opportunities they may identify uh, as this project moves forward. So um, at this time, the council is requested to adopt the resolution uh, authorizing the joint application with the county and to participate in the Home Key 2 uh, program. Uh, as I mentioned, it will bring forward additional documents at the January 27th meeting and staff is available for any questions you may have. Jay, thank you. And I see that we also have a number of individuals from the county that are available uh, to answer questions if we have them. Are there questions from uh, council? I don't see any hands going up. So uh, if there are no questions from uh, council, is there a motion? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Um, I guess I don't have I don't have questions, but I do want to just offer a clarification because we we did get public con public comment through our email about mm -hmm. this item and um, the, those comments were related to whether or not the location was proper for for it. And I think that's you know a conversation that um, we had before. And but I did want to just clarify for the public that this is talking about getting funding. Um, so I think that there's a distinction here, whether or not you think that this is the right location, we do want to, if move forward for a navigation center, we do want money from other sources and not just city money. Um, so that's just something important to kind of clarify, um, for, for the public and kind of what this is, you know, we do want funding for, um, uh, home, you know, to help unhoused people. And this is going to be a big part of that. Mayor Pro Tem, thank you for that clarification. That's helpful. Uh, are there, uh, Council Member Woods? I just, I want to follow up on that. Uh, I think it's a good point. The funding that we're going after, the, however, is based upon an, an escrow J that we're currently in. But we're currently in an escrow and there is funding that we are pursuing to help uh, address all the costs of this project. Right. So this is one requirement of one piece of funding for all of the project. Okay, and one of my, and just to follow, one of my points has always been on even looking at this site was that, that we have the funding to even do it, that we don't go into an escrow without an understanding of the financial ramifications of it, which this is a step in doing, and that's correct. Uh, we, in escrow, we have the option to complete the escrow or not complete the escrow. So uh, securing the funds will have a lot to do with that. Right, and when, how long is our escrow um, open for? Uh, escrow is open for until currently until January 28th. We are pursuing an extension. However, we do not know if the seller will uh, be amenable to, to an, any more extensions. So how does this request that we're doing dovetail with that escrow? By approving this um, 
request, we will have uh, an application into the state housing community development um, department for approval of these funds. Uh, and that application is due January 31st. So that would provide funding to, uh, as we plan the capital improvements for, for this project. The acquisition of the project would be done with funds from the county. And that's the agreement we plan to bring forward uh, in two weeks is the agreement for the, um, for the uh, county uh, financing of $5.9 million. So that purchase of 5.9 million that the county's willing to pay will, will, will dovetail with when the escrow closes and it will be back to us in, in, a, in a time frame. And that's really separate from the larger amount of funding that we're going for build out and operations. That is correct. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, Council Member Coors. Yeah, okay, I wanna make sure I'm clear now. Um, my understanding is we're getting around $7 million from the county, which covers buying it and sort of the estimate for the renovations. That That is happening, right? So that is that. Um, and the city has some money that we're also planning to use the rest, I think five plus million from the grant we got that we need to um, encumber, uh, I think by next year, um, for any other reservations and to start the initial operations, right? So that's my understanding. I also recall the provider said that after a couple of years, they believe they can raise the money to run, do this, but we're also seeking up to $50 million with the county for other funding that could be used for this or other projects for housing for people who are unhoused? Uh, no, the funding we're applying for is specific for this project. Okay. 50 million uh, was a uh, number that was something where it was a not to exceed number. Right. In reality, the request will probably be more like 25 million. Uh, and the award, should we get it, and we're crossing our fingers, maybe even half of that. So uh, 12 and a half million or so. And that is to go towards the, um, the build out, as you say. Um, and uh, we're also, um, the, the homeless grant that the city received is being allocated pretty much entirely uh, for uh, operating subsidies for the next, uh, which will be allowed to run for the next to nine years of the project. So it'll help out a great deal. Okay, so this is this is home key money for later. The county's ARPA money is what's covering the build out and all of that. Um, and then we have the 5 million in our grant that could also be used towards that as well. And home key money, would be to help over many years operations. I just want to make sure I understand it. So, if, and the public understands this. And it, we're not contingent on getting a $25 million grant to open this, right? Maybe the city manager. Can oh, that is, that's correct. We are not. Okay. Oh, well. Oh, I think that's what Councilmember Woods was trying to get at. Um, to some degree. So I'm just trying to see if we can get some clarity on that. And, and, and if I could, and Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, we also have Greg Rodriguez here with the county. I think our original estimates, and they were very conceptual estimates, was that uh, acquisition and remodeling of the building would be closer to $12, $13 million all in. Initially, we had identified the possibility of using some of our HAP funds for construction. But as we've really started to close in on this deal, we are really working to be as creative as we can with the sources of money. So the questions we're asking when we sit down and meet on this is, which sources are used best for which components of the project? From that conversation, we've decided what Jay's describing, that really the, the county funds are good for acquisition. If we can get these home key two funds for some of the construction build out, that would leave some of the HAP funds for operations. But that's a little bit fluid, right? If some of those don't happen the way they anticipate, the worst case scenario that we describe 
was that with the county's money and the city's HAP fund, we'd have a fairly small gap. And between fundraising or some discretionary funds from fund balance, we could close that one, two million dollar gap or something like that. But really now with some of these funds um, being applied for before we even close escrow, we have the potential to do far, far better than that by millions of dollars. That's not a promise, of course, um, but we're doing our best to identify those sources and pursue them aggressively. Okay, that helps. Um, and it's good to know you're looking as always to figure out what funds are the most fun, you know, can be used for the most things. And I'm thrilled we're applying for this grant. I'm happy to make the motion. Um, but I just want to be clear that if we don't get this grant, we're not like, okay, we're, we're sitting with an empty building with nothing. And that's, and thank you for um, both for clarifying that. So yeah, that's correct. Motion. We have, we have backup plans even beyond the sources I've described and, and other okay. opportunities that we would try to take advantage of. Great. Well, I'm always happy to make a motion to apply for up to $50 million of um, funding. So I'm happy to do that. Is there further discussion? Council member uh, Woods. You know, I, we've used terms, have funds and things of that nature, but uh, Jay, I just want you for the public to simplify it because everyone asks us, what are you doing with the $10 million, right? I mean, they know the $10 million, they don't know the name of the fund. So um, if you could just, um, I could do it, but if you could just go ahead and tell them a little bit about that money is being used for this. That's and correct. What left of that money and what we use that money for, just as a, as a refresher to everybody. Right, right. Uh, yes, the funds we speak about, the uh, 5.3 to be contributed towards operating costs of this project is part of the $10 million grant that's known as the HAP, HAP funds. Uh, $2 million has already been allocated or has been approved as part of the agreement with Vista Sunrise 2 to provide permanent supportive housing. Another $2 million was approved as part of the ALO project to provide permanent supportive housing. So that's four plus the 5.3. And we have uh, uh, administrative costs that we're able to utilize in the amount of $700,000. So uh, that's, that's the 10. Thank you. I think that's great. And just for the public, I want the, we are using that money. I think there's been some rumor out there that we're not used, that we're sitting on it. Um, We've been very strategic about how we use it. Uh, we've taken a lot of input about, I mean, two years ago when I came on from council and Grace and I came on, I think one of our first meetings was about um, homelessness. So it's great that it's coming to fruition in a couple of projects and potentially with this project here, which sounds very good. And um, I'm um, positive about that because the only way that we are going to, um, solve the problem, um, and I think the mayor will reiterate this with me, is we have to provide beds. Beds allows us an opportunity to be more assertive uh, in our programs to get people off the streets and into housing. So um, I just wanted to state that and I would support the motion. Is there further uh, comment or questions? Uh, then we have, um, a motion, and I believe we have a second from uh, Council Member Woods. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Council Member Holstage. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right. Thank you, and thank you to all the folks from the county who uh, stuck with us and then didn't have to say anything. Uh, let's move on to item uh, 5B, which is a review of the roster of uh, city council subcommittees, liaisons, and representatives to external organizations. And it's my understanding that we had uh, so far one request for change. Uh, Mr. Mejia, would you like to report? Yeah, Madam Mayor and City Council, on an annual basis, the City Council reviews its assignments to subcommittees and external organizations. Typically on non-election years, the changes are minimal. And I'm requesting that the City Council designate a new uh, interviewing subcommittee for boards and commissions, noting that Councilmember Garner and Holstead served in 2020 and Mayor Middleton and Councilmember Woods served this past year. 
In addition, Mayor Pro Tem Garner previously requested that the City Council consider designating a new primary representative for the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership. Otherwise, I defer to any council member who would like to make any additional changes uh, to their appointments, and I'm available for questions. Great. So we need, uh, let's start with, we need two individuals to uh, uh, agree to be on the boards and commissions and- uh, My turn. <laughs> it's your turn. So I am happy to do it for this, this year. I think it's my turn in the rotation and then someone else has to do it for the second time, I think. I, it's true. And uh, so the, the next uh, on the rotation is, uh, I see council member Garner raising her hand. Are you volunteering to be the second? Yes, I, I think right. I, have, I have good capacity. All right. Here. Uh, then is there anyone who wants to elbow them out of the way? <laughs> I then uh, do we need to take a vote on this, Anthony, or can we uh, only at the end? Only at the end. All right. So we've got that one. The second was uh, CVAP. Uh, I have been the alternate and I am willing to step up and be uh, the primary appointee. But if there's anyone who wants to elbow me out of the way uh, for this, I'm more than happy to be elbowed. <laughs> I saw everybody's elbows <laughs> crashing into their rib cage. <laughs> So I will take that. And I believe Council Member Garner uh, agreed to be the alternate uh, on that. So uh, with that, Anthony, I believe we have all of the changes we're going to make on this item for this year. Uh, Wonderful. I will move that we approve. I'll second. Okay. Mayor Middleton. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I had a question. So are we keeping sort of... I think we had five liaisons that were going to be doing quarterly meetings, or are we not going to do those? I... And do those more as working groups as needed or things along those lines, since they haven't really met as quarterly and, you know, um, and they seem to be more issue by issue as things come up. So before we voted, I just wanted to get folks thoughts on that or the city manager may have thoughts since he popped up on the screen. Yeah. And, and, and so I know Anthony mentioned liaisons and subcommittees, and we've gone through a couple iterations of those groups and what we've called them. Um, but one of the things we'll discuss in a future item when we get to uh, visioning is we did have some discussions about doing away with some of the more formal committees, but I'm suggesting at least for conversation that maybe you retain some of the interest areas you have, right? So that would still enable council members interested in housing or homelessness or tourism to participate in the groups that they have, as well as working groups that might form or committees that might be assigned, but to, um, to do those activities in lieu of the standing committees that we're meeting uh, on a regular basis. That's a point of discussion for council. Can I get clarification on that? I think um, um, the standing committees um, actually have, is a workload for not only the person that's on it, and it leaves the other council members out of the loop on that, but the because they can't participate because it's more than two council members. But it also means that you are producing agendas, you're coordinating a meeting, you're setting up a space and all of that. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's one of the reasons to consider working groups and other ways of participating opposed to having a standing committee where you're, you tend to generate all of those activities on a regular basis, monthly or, or less often. I don't think, in my personal view, um, I don't really think that um, uh, when I'm looking at the, the, the existing standing committees that are in the thing, which includes finance, affordable housing, homelessness, cannabis, economic development, and vacation rentals, that they can't be done in a working group or on an ad hoc as needed basis. Other than finance, which I think is in our charter, by the way. Okay. Yeah, only because that's come up years ago. So I remember that. I didn't do a great. I tend to agree that that's probable. Uh, what I'd like to see us uh, consider, though, is uh, as we get into the next agenda item and see how it plays out over the course of this year with the idea of adding study sessions 
uh, to our uh, calendar on a regular basis that uh, that we evaluate what that we need to uh, do a do away with these standing committees uh, based on our actual experience with uh, uh, trying to incorporate study sessions into our calendar. And Madam Mayor, so so if I'm understanding, uh, basically we would be taking our standing subcommittees, changing their frequency of meeting to as need, but retaining those uh, four standing committees for the interim period. That would be my suggestion. Why are we maintaining them for an interim period? I don't understand. What's the purpose? What, what, what would be the benefit? We don't know yet as to whether or not uh, these kinds of study sessions that we want to do are going to work out for us, that we're going to be able to find uh, uh, the time in our calendars to, uh, to make them happen. And uh, do these as a uh, committee of the whole. So for me, it's simply a placeholder. And, and, and Mayor and Council, if I might, if, if Council's not interested in changing the assignments, in other words, there were already kind of people allocated or, or um, given those roles, as we describe, uh, housing, homelessness, cannabis, vacation rentals, et cetera. If, if those assignments still work for council, we could defer whether or not those are standing committees waiting for meetings or whether or not we shift to working groups and other ways of conducting that same business um, as early as the very next agenda item and, and discuss further the kind of merits of, of different approaches. My only question is, are any... Since I'm not on those, because I have other things, you know, we as on so a bunch of other organizations. Are any of those meeting? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know they were meeting on a regular basis. So it'd be great if the folks on them would then share with the rest of council those meetings. Otherwise, we and the public don't don't know that I didn't know that they were meeting. So if I don't know, then no one knows, right? In the public. And so if we are gonna have those, I think we need reports in council member comments and subcommittee <laughs> reports. That's what we need to agenda. The title says on what's happened in those meetings, because I think there was one on cannabis that was shared um, over the last year that I don't remember any others. Uh, so if we're gonna keep them, please do make sure we get those as subcommittee reports under that agenda item we have at every meeting. Right? We have it all been meeting, yeah, so. We've I'm reported sorry. from business retention when we've had them, but we haven't had one since September, I think. Right. We report every time we have business retention, which um, we haven't been holding on a quarterly basis, but more as an ad needed on as needed basis for affordable housing and homelessness. Um, staff had tried to schedule quarterly meetings. Um, and I said, what's the purpose of this meeting? <laughs> I don't want to have a meeting for a meeting. Um, you know, and then it sets up expectations. Like I have people coming to my town hall saying, you're not doing anything on housing and homelessness. You haven't met. And that's not the case. We're just doing this work in uh, council. So everyone can be involved and the public can be involved. So, um, we have not been meeting quarterly, um, for most, for the ones that I'm involved in. Um, vacation rentals, I think is a little bit different just because really staff was facilitating stakeholder meetings that had started when the, when the ordinance happened and then with compliance. And so that might be separate and apart from council um, standing committees that work could continue, but not have council members. So yeah, those, most of these groups have not been meeting quarterly because there's not always work to be doing every quarter. And so I support the working group model and we can discuss it um, at the next item, but I would support dissolving these for now. We can always restart them as needed at any meeting. I'll second that. <laughs> Is there further discussion on that? Okay. So uh, do let's take that uh, issue separately from, uh, from the others if we can, uh, just to make sure we get clarity. So the motion is to dissolve 
all of the standing committees with the exception of the finance committee, which is covered by uh, a requirement in our charter. So uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Holstech. Yes. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Council Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right. So then we'll take the balance of every, of uh, the two changes, uh, and uh, I made that motion. We've got it. Uh, was there a second? Yes. Yes, Council. So roll call, please. Mayor Mayor Middleton. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Council Member Holstitch. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. So the last item on our agenda this evening is uh, 5C. This is a report on the city council uh, visioning uh, sessions. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, the city manager for a staff report. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. I'm excited to present the results of two days of visioning sessions. I'm going to attempt to distill that information into a fairly concise report, but there is a lot to cover. The way this is structured is as we go and I present component pieces, I'll identify what we think are next steps from having gone through that exercise with council and offer a few more specifics than what are included in the staff report. Those are the good opportunities to pause and make sure that staff has done a good job characterizing um, the conversation that council had during those sessions and the direction that we've been given. Um, because I want the, the public to get kind of the maximum value of the presentation, I will have a PowerPoint. So I just might need to share and unshare the screen a few times if we have moments where we need to deliberate. But again, this is largely a summary of the conversation we had in those two sessions. So um, unless we miss some significant things, this should largely reflect the conversations that we've had. So with that, I will attempt to share my screen. And if you all are seeing what I'm seeing, we're on the first slide and ready to go. Okay, so I mentioned that we had two sessions on November 20th and 30th. I'll, I'll pause for just a second to mention that those were a closed visioning sessions. They were closed primarily because the matter of establishing priorities and even some of the process improvement related things we'll discuss are really kind of the expectations of the city manager and will be primary tools in evaluating the city manager's performance on an ongoing basis. Uh, these visioning sessions are something I think we should do annually and I'll, I'll show you what I think that cycle looks like here in just a second. But really each time we do it, I think there are two broad areas that we're trying to discuss. The first is priority setting. Uh, that's often for the next fiscal year, but as we'll see in a moment, many of those priorities do stretch multiple years. And then we also want to step back and review processes. You know, everything we do, including the way we structure these council meetings, is a process. And as we'll see in a minute when we get to that section of the presentation, it's really important. We spend almost all of our time in those processes, actually just going through them as they've been created. Very rarely do we step back and look at those processes as component pieces and as part of an entire system and, and tweak them or change them as needed. Um, in fact, we you reflected some of those changes just a moment ago in the last agenda item you know, about uh, subcommittee work and, and, and you'll see some references to that. So bottom line is we always wanna take an opportunity to do those two things as part of an annual cycle that looks something like this. And this is also reflective of the process we went through this year. Now, first is to collect input. You know, we conducted a community survey. We solicited feedback from our commissions, uh, from some of our uh, staff and de departments. And we pull that all together in a way to capture kind of the, the state of the community, if you will. And we bring that information to council visioning sessions where we do this work to identify the strategic priorities and those targeted process improvements. What we'll see from there are kind of work plans where we do some more detailed planning of, of how we're going to accomplish those priorities. That usually is accompanied by a budget request, sometimes personnel requests, or any number of other component pieces that are needed to advance each one of the, the priority areas. Then we're largely in the mode of execution throughout the year. 
But as that cycle concludes, we want to review where we've been, report progress in, as we enter into the cycle over again uh, to collect input and, and basically you know, start the whole cycle over again. So that's, that's kind of an annual thing that generally the, the collection part will start uh, in the fall, visioning session sometime in winter so that the work plans are well coordinated with our fiscal year that begins July 1. If there are questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt. Otherwise, I'll go through this material a little bit quickly given the hour. So the, the conversations were very uh, productive and, and rather free flowing, um, but we were able to extrapolate from those some good organizing themes and principles. And it's important to understand that the work doesn't just come in a vacuum, but that we're really um, using these as drivers of the priorities and, and, and want people to recognize that. So the first theme that was very common in the conversation was optimizing basic services and facilities. Uh, the mayor at one point used the term back to basics. This is really the notion that um, while there are some new programs we want to build, some new projects, et cetera, we don't want to ignore the things we're doing already. We've already talked this evening about paving roads and preserving our, our pavement surfaces, investing in parks and other facilities, um, services like building inspection and code enforcement and you name it. We want to make sure that those services are up to snuff. Another theme that emerged was to focus on issues that most impact quality of life. You know, that might go without saying, but you can never say it too much. Um, it's, this is to some extent a lens through which we would view all of the priorities. We want to narrow the priorities to focus on the most important issues first. And, and I've got to say, um, it's, it's, it's common in all systems of government, and certainly local government is no exception. There is simply more demand, there are more needs, more wants than we could ever meet over any period of time, um, let alone when you're trying to do everything all at once. It's really uh, the old adage, if everything's important, nothing's important. And I, I've said to a few people that your priorities aren't the things you talk about. They're the things that um, that you act on. And one of the best measures that something is important is what you're willing to give up. And I don't want to belabor this too much, but you know, if you want to be a gold medalist in, in a sport, think of all the things you're going to give up in that pursuit to be that good at one thing. Um, you know, we don't have to go to that extreme, but we do have to be clear on what the most important things are. Um, we, we have meetings till 11 or midnight all the time and sometimes don't get to the entire agenda. We don't want to get through a year and look back and say, boy, we did a lot of things that in retrospect, I would sacrifice if we could have made more progress on the most important work. So that's the point of really establishing these priorities is to make sure that our focus and our time and energy and money are directed in the right uh, way. Priorities should be integrated. That also should go without saying, but sometimes these priorities do live in silos. And we want to make sure that if we're looking at a park improvement, that we're looking at other priorities like quality of life, like environmental stewardship and the kinds of things that, that we'll outline here in a minute. And then lastly, some major principles, social equity and sustainability came up frequently. And, and so it rather than being priorities in and of themselves, they're kind of major principles that underpin all of our priorities. So again, a lens through which we would view the work, which gives us the opportunity when we're undertaking a project or looking at a program to ask the question, how does this help us advance social equity? How does it help us advance sustainability? Or is the program sustainable long-term, et cetera? So with all of that in mind and, and the conversations that ensued from those basic categories, I wanna outline for uh, especially the people at home, the areas and the kind of sub-level tasks that have been generated. So first and up front is quality of life. And you see the five sections here relating to this subject. I, I'll say, you know, there is as much art as science involved in kind of categorizing things. So I don't want to get too hung up. We'll notice in a little bit that some of these priorities could probably fit in more than one category. This is just a simple way of organizing the work that we want to do. And you can see the categories here, improve homelessness, reduce crime, advance economic development, expand housing affordability, and then neighborhood issues. 
Um, below each one are some individual you know, notes that help people un and us understand what it means to undertake those items. So as an example, with improving homelessness, we want to build a navigation center. We've talked about that, um, but that's not all we want to do. Uh, in order to improve homelessness, we need to get better at coordinating some of the service providers. We need to get better. Uh, we need to improve security, improve maintenance, and we need to expand our own homeless response team, whatever that means, uh, in order to really have a, a full suite of services that together will improve homelessness. Similarly, as we look at reducing crime, we want to evaluate our police department and service levels. That's something that we'll probably do in a few departments, but it's especially important as we look to uh, have an impact on some of what we've seen uh, lately with trends uh, of rising crime. Uh, with Chief Mills coming on board, he's been a proponent of a neighborhood policing model, and we'll all get opportunities to learn more about what that means. But it's 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 a way of connecting our police officers more intimately to neighborhoods, business districts, et cetera, where they would serve. It's a focus on violent crime. And then we also, of course, in wanting to reduce property crime, um, want to educate residents on preventing property crime. Uh, the vast majority of property crimes are crimes of opportunity. That doesn't mean there isn't more involved in reducing uh, property crime through traditional policing and other tactics, including just um, you know, economic development and reducing some of the impetus for crime. But it's also important, of course, um, that, that we reduce those crimes of opportunity. Uh, advancing economic development, this was an item that stays on the list and, and council acknowledged that it was very important, but admittedly part of what we're doing and, and one of those major themes that we discussed is narrowing the priorities to be kind of realistic. And so it was acknowledged that for at least the foreseeable future, perhaps the next year, maybe beyond, advancing economic development probably needs to be constrained to a couple items that are very timely and in front of us right now. Uh, one of those is lobbying for the West Valley campus of College of the Desert, and the other is noting the importance of broadband in tomorrow, well, today's economy, it's almost yesterday's economy at this point, um, monitoring broadband opportunities to see if there are grant sources or other initiatives whereby we would um, improve our broadband connectivity. Expanding uh, housing affordability. We talked a lot about housing just earlier this evening. Um, we do have a general plan with a housing element. I'm not sure that that has the full complement of tools and techniques and things that would really ensure that we meet those goals. So we ought to consider creating a housing plan that would identify those tools. Uh, could be the beginning of a housing program. Um, expand some of our policies. We've looked at inclusionary zoning as one example, but again, there are many other policies as we saw tonight with um, some of the things, the ordinance to comply with SB9. Uh, we wanna pursue new affordable housing developments. So that's something we can do in parallel as we're undertaking some of those other tasks. Expand staffing. Uh, I'll point out that we're always looking for alignment or malalignment between our priorities and our actions as I described earlier. Homelessness and housing are two of the very top priorities we have, and we don't have a single staff person dedicated to do only those things. Obviously, we have some talented team members pursuing those priorities, but it's that to me says we have some malalignment. So we, we likely need to expand staffing in these areas. And then, of course, just building some of the uh, housing programs. And then lastly, in this category is neighborhood issues. Um, we do have a, a noise ordinance that the city's talked about for a while, um, some recommendations that have been made by stakeholder groups. So we, we wanna close the loop on that at some point um, within this cycle of priorities. And then we've also begun conversations on a reparations program for some of our uh, neighbors and neighborhoods that had experienced um, you know, some of what occurred uh, decades ago with Section 14. So I can go through these, um, I'll go through each category, uh, but this might be a good opportunity to pause and just make sure that staff has kind of adequately and correctly captured uh, council's intent in establishing these priorities in this category of uh, quality of life or answer any questions you may have. And that was very good. I see a couple of hands go up. Uh, I think I saw council member Woods hand go up first. So um, just to be clear um, to the community and to reiterate what we all talked about, we're really taking on a couple of new ventures for our government that wasn't necessarily there before. 
um, homelessness, as an example, um, you know, is is going to be you know a big thing. Um, taking on um, affordable housing, you know, which we haven't necessarily taken on. You just said we're not really staffed up for it. You know, these are new components that we're taking on, um, and that's that's great. I just when I, we looked at the neighborhood issues part of it, it was thin. And I just want to reiterate that we do not want to let neighborhood quality of life disintegrate. We just talked about street paving and slurry seal and things of that nature. But we also just did a pedestrian study and we talked about traffic calming. Those are neighborhood issues that are still a priority. And I think they need to be added in under neighborhood um, and not just focus on big new programs. Yeah, th thank you for that note. And as we'll see as we go through the others, or, or even on that first slide with quality of life, the categorization, I, I don't want to say it's arbitrary, but you could do it a lot of different ways. So for instance, later on with community infrastructure, we have a focus on bike and pet. Certainly reducing crime is a neighborhood issue, but we put it as its own category instead of under neighborhoods. Same thing with homelessness. It's, it's a critical way to improve certain neighborhoods. Um, so it could fit there, but we put it under its own category. So I, I, I as we go through, uh, consider that piece too, that, that we could move some things around or um, as we present items uh, to council as follow-up, we'll probably uh, talk about how they align with this priorities document and they're likely to address more than one category, right? Um, lots of these things, um, street paving, you know, might be an example of community infrastructure, but it's also a neighborhood issue, right? We don't, in this case, we haven't listed it twice. We've decided to put it in one category or the other, even though it addresses both. All right, council member Coors. Um, I just had one question and maybe it fits under neighborhood issues. Maybe it fits under housing um, and maybe my recollection is wrong. Um, but I thought one of the things we did want to talk about was um, looking at vacation rentals. I think, um, you know, we have family homes with long-term tenants now sort of being converted. We have, I think, 1,500 vacation rentals disappearing in neighboring cities. Um, and I thought we wanted to discuss some issues around that. Um, I don't remember the noise ordinance issue, but I do remember vacation rental issues. So yeah, so, um, so it's a higher priority, uh, and, you know, for this period anyway. That's right. I, the, one of the only reasons, and we can certainly put it on the list, but the, my recollection of that conversation, um, the priorities also are meant to reflect things that are, are fairly significant in scope and scale. And, and vacation rentals is certainly an important item, but where council was unclear was whether significant change needs to be made or not. And so councils seem to land on, at least my recollection is, certainly we ought to have a presentation and review the data and see where we're at and see if that is something that we need to focus on. If we were reconsidering uh, some of our rules and regulations or something more significant, I think we would need to go back to the priority list and, and see where it fits and what might need to give. But I don't know that council was sure that it would be that involved, but certainly did think that we need to um, we need to review the data and see where we're at and have a check in at least. So I could add it to the list for that purpose, but we also didn't want to convey or miscommunicate that that meant we were opening up the whole thing and that changes were necessarily going to happen if it started with a review. Um, yeah, I think we wanted to collect all the data, which I know a lot is being collected, how many contracts each house does. Um, but I think there were discussions, um, and I know um, Mayor Pro Tem uh, and I have mentioned a couple times on, you know, things about how we're going to deal with, you know, people buying houses, evicting long-term tenants to turn into vacation rentals, and some other issues that I think we definitely wanted to do. I don't, I don't think it was a discussion of making rewriting the ordinance from scratch or, you know, banning vacation rentals, but that there were some things we really did want to look at and we wanted the data so we could do it. So I think having it on the list, because that was the only thing I heard about um, when this came out was you're doing nothing. You're not going to talk about vacation rentals and, you know, how you're doing code enforcement has come up and is there going to be a cap given all the other cities are canceling it? So I thought that was something we at least wanted to have on something we wanted to make sure we got to this year. 
Yeah, so let's pause on that real quick then. And okay. um, any objection to adding that, I think we would add it under neighborhood issues and we would describe it as, you know, review the data and have a check in on vacation rentals. Any objection to that? I just don't remember that we talked about that ever <laughs> at all. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't remember that noise was set as a priority either. So I'm a little off. I'm a little um, being hit blindsided here. Okay, so so I do have notes on both of those items um, from from the sessions on on noise. I think the city acknowledged that it is uh, an important issue, um, uh, somewhat of a divisive one, and that it may be deferred at least to tackle some of these other items first, which was not to meant to say we wouldn't get to it, but that it might be later in our work planning. Um, at least that's what is in my notes, uh, just given the sheer volume of other high priorities we have on the list, but that we wanted to get to it somewhere within the cycle, given the conversations that we've had and, and some of the um, suggestions that have been advanced to council. It is, uh, council, I'm sorry, Mayor Putin Garner. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is that okay? Uh, Council Member Woods, were you finished? I, I, my, I guess I was going to say that, you know, um, I don't think noise ordinance is going to be simple. And there's a lot of big things. If we're going to accomplish that in six months, um, are we adding too much? That's kind of what I had a concern about. Right. Um, yeah. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair con fair concern, but I, I do think that my remember remembering all of this is that part of affordable housing and trying to make sure that we had housing for people vac looking at our vacation rentals was part of that. Um, that's what I remember from the conversation um, because we are seeing that our housing prices are significantly higher than other desert cities as well. Um, and I think that vacation rentals have a lot to do with that. So, so if there's no objection, I can add that um, to at least review. Um, I would, or, or if we want to discuss it further. I think it's something that we need to review, but I do very much appreciate the uh, manner in which you were describing the review. Uh, one in which uh, we look at the data and try to get... Uh, a true understanding of what's happening. Uh, um, for the most part, uh, and while opinion is really divided when it comes to vacation rentals, uh, most conversations I have begin with a conclusion and then go searching for an anecdote uh, that supports the conclusion. And I would love to be able to see uh, an objective, hard, review of data as to what's actually happening. Okay. Any other feedback in this area? I, Council thank, Member Halstitch. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with my colleagues on the noise ordinance. Um, we've already worked for a long time on the noise ordinance. Um, that's a really significant lift. Um, and I did not hear majority support for that being um, considered. And just to be clear for the public, we should um, explain the timing of this visioning um, and goals. So I remember from that meeting in the next year, we didn't think we could tackle the noise ordinance and opening that up. So I don't think it should be on this list. Okay, yep. Um, I, I'm I'm fine with that. And just to explain to members of the public, because, you know, I, I opened up with you really can't do everything. And I think we've had a habit of trying our best. And so we have meetings that, you know, here we are 10 o'clock, um, probably not going to wrap this one up tonight. And some of them sometimes get deferred for two or three or four meetings, which can be two months. And the bottom line is uh, the point that was made that maybe this is too much. I not not to be the bearer of bad news, but I assure you that it is. I assure you our list is substantially too much. But 
in order to get in the habit of really focusing on our priorities and getting better um, at council and at staff of scaling our work, what we're going to do is turn these strategic goals that are fairly broad, these priorities, into work plans. Those work plans are going to be more detailed, and they're going to assign tasks to a schedule. And then I'm proposing, and we've discussed with council, that we review that every few months. One, so that we don't lose sight of it. Two, so that we're all on the same page with what work we're doing, and most importantly, what we're sacrificing, which is largely the other work that's still important, but just not as important. And and, and that's the goal of this. By the time we do that for a little while, I, I think we'll get more accustomed to really how much we can do as we're also trying to grow the capacity of the organization so that we can do a little more than what we have historically, especially recently during the pandemic. I'm going to express what I what may be a minority point of view, but the noise ordinance, particularly uh, for our residents that live close to where significant music events occur on a regular basis is an extremely high priority uh, to them and the quality of their life. Uh, and if we do not address uh, the noise ordinance uh, at some point during the course of this year, uh, there, there will be a very, very large number of uh, angry individuals uh, as a result of uh, concerts and other events that have taken place uh, that uh, have uh, caused individuals to, uh, to frankly scream at us. Uh, and, but in their opinion, not nearly as loudly as uh, they were uh, assaulted by the uh, music events. So, uh, but again, I, I don't have the votes, I don't have the votes, but I, I am going to express uh, uh, support for bringing uh, a review up to us. I don't have a, um, an issue with uh, addressing it. It's, 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 this is about priorities and when, and that list is so big um, that I'd hate to give out, uh, give the list out to the public, which is now public, with an expectation that we can't meet and then we fail. And that's my concern is that the whole idea of doing this was to set expectations that are achievable. Um, and, um, and I think it's a six month period and a reevaluation at that. Um, and housing alone is a big deal. I mean, just the navigation center is a lot of staff time. That, that's my only concern is that we set we don't set unrealistic expectations that the public then is angry at us even more so than the problem that we didn't fix it within the time frame we set. And, and so to, to clarify, I, I do think that these priorities are meant to reflect roughly a, a year of effort, especially as we go into work plans, but many, many, many of them will continue beyond a year. And also that year, in, at least in my mind, starts next fiscal year. That doesn't mean we don't do work now. We're obviously already working on a, a navigation center. But this annual cycle I described, we do a lot of the planning during this time. We do the budgeting over the next few months so that when we start our fiscal year, July 1, we're ready to undertake a lot of these things. So, so we may be splitting hairs a little bit on whether it's 12 months or 18 months or, or whenever it is. I think the conversation, at least from my notes um, from the visiting session, is exactly what's happening here. We it, we should tackle it at some point, but it might not be up there with homelessness or some of the other top priorities. So one way to resolve that is on the list, off the list for now. Another way to resolve it is as we do this work planning, that's really the more detailed phase of prioritizing and shorter timeframes, three months, six months, and, and see when we can get to it. I, I do think it will be a little while given the size of other super high priorities. If I can, Madam Mayor, I, one thing right. on, on that is, is there are things, for instance, like the noise ordinance, where if we are going to do a complete overhaul, yes, that's going to be take a significant amount of time. But if we focus it in on the, on the very specific issue that my residents are most concerned about, for instance, who I think <clears throat> make up the bulk of the uh, discussion that we hear, it's base level noise, right? So I think that there are ways that we can 
do things in a very targeted way to try to address very specific issues that our community is facing without having it get out of hand. But we have to agree <laughs> to, to do that approach. And that's where I think we have a little bit of a hard time. Um, but I just want to throw that out there for people because um, I think that that could be something that we consider as a council to be very specific and targeted in some of our items um, with, with that in mind. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. I, I, I just want to agree with that. I think that's, you know, one of the things here, this list already, we couldn't get through in 18 months, right? We have four to five hours twice a month in meetings, even if we had a study session. You know, some of these big issues like vacation rentals, I mean, there must have been 30, 40 hours of subcommittee meetings with stakeholders. And we don't want to do those meetings that way. I mean, these, these are just to tackle the whole thing. So if we could, you know, do the specific major piece we need to address without taking it all on, I just think that's a way maybe to get some of those other ones done sooner than later, if that makes, I mean, I like that idea a lot. And that's really the other purpose of work planning and engaging council in that exercise every few months, especially in the beginning, is because we have the choice whether to do a part or the whole thing. And we also have the choice whether to really spend a lot of time perfecting policy or whether we spend a good chunk of time getting it mostly right and waiting to evaluate it again. Most people have heard the 80-20 rule. It's, it's really true. We get 80% of our results from 20% of our effort. So if we can calibrate that way as we're tackling these things, we'll get more done. Some of them won't be perfect, but we'll make progress overall with this list. But, but those will be decisions you'll get to make. You don't have to make them all tonight. As we present the work plans, what already seems large is going to be obviously larger. And, and, and at the staff level, we're doing it. So I, I can say with confidence, they're, they're even bigger than they appear. Yeah. Council Member Holstrich. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond to that. Um, I think that it's a nice sentiment and goal, but what we've learned is that when we open something up, we open something up and we'll get public comment and the public wants to go one way and it gets very dramatic and um, it's a lot. So um, if we can get true consensus from the council, like we don't have true consensus about what happens with the noise ordinance. Some of us want polar opposite things, right? So then that's opening up the entire issue. Um, but I like the idea of getting really, really concrete and specific um, to both of those points. And I think that will help us, right? We want to reduce violent crime by 20%. We want to reduce homicides, right? Like the most, the more specific we can get, I think that gets us to really targeted goals. Um, and then we can build a work plan around that. So that's, I know we've talked about that, but um, that's the specificity that I'd like to see um, when we get to this next step of the plan, you know, we don't just want a housing plan, you know, we want to create a housing plan that, you know, creates 2000 units or whatever that goal is. Right. Um, but yeah, I just, in my experience now, uh, four years, it's anything gets opened up and it's opening up any kind of can of worms and sometimes ones we can't even predict. Yeah, agreed. Um, and, and that's not just here. That's, I think, everywhere. You know, it's, um, it's, it's hard doing democracy. It really is. Okay, if, if, if we're ready for now, um, I don't know that we have consensus on noise being on or off, but we, we understand that we need to do some work planning and prioritize. So for now, I would propose that it stays on, but we see we see where it comes up as we put these work plans together, which with the work plans will be for a 12 month period. And we'll see how much work we have to do. I'm hearing one council member or mayor say, okay. yes, it should be on. Am I hearing any others since I did not hear that? In the limited way I mentioned, yes. So two. <laughs> So is, is there a broader consensus to remove it for now and to keep it on our list for future priority setting discussions, meaning, you know, this time next year? That would be my vote. 
Uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, have everyone uh, weigh in on this uh, with a vote. So is the noise on or off? Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, support that we leave it on uh, and that uh, uh, it become a matter for the city manager to determine where it falls in terms of workflow. Oh. I'll, I would take it off as a priority for the next 12 months. Um, you know, and if I know two council members worked on a proposal, especially on base noise, and if there is a proposal written, you know, they could fit in for a discussion just on that at some point. I have no objection. Um, but I know, and it's sort of to um, council member uh, Polson's point, there, and the mayor's point. There are a group of residents who, you know, are very much want to change it. And there are a lot of other folks who very much want to change it the other way, right? Want to allow louder music, more parties at their houses, more events, more things that residents get to do where noise isn't limited, at, you know, so early. And I, I just think this is dozens and dozens of hours of staff time and hours and hours of our time. And so given housing, homelessness, all the other things on this list, I, my, my recommendation is, my preference is not to have it on this list, but if there is something, you know, that we can cut and paste on the key issue of base and bring it forward that's already written from another city, that I don't object to. That's sort of my compromise in the middle there. Okay. Someone want to go next? I'm happy to go next. I. Um... Uh, you know, the noise ordinance, needs, or, noise ordinance needs to be worked on, but not just for concerts. You know, you can be talking in your backyard after 10 o'clock at night and you're violating our noise ordinance as it currently is. I mean, there's a lot of nuances to a noise ordinance that's unbelievable. And I don't think there's quick fixes. I think it needs to be looked at holistically. We need to spend the time to do that. Um, and we want to do it right. Um, because we have a lot of stakeholders with very different opinions in our city. And I think in order to get all of that information and assimilate it, it's going to take time with our other priorities. I actually think, you know, street calming and stuff like that to slow traffic to get, um, our, is to quiet our streets um, is more of a priority right now and sp spend time on that later. So I, um, I would say, I'm not saying ditch it. I'm just saying, Postpone it. Right. I agree. Uh, Council Member Garner, or excuse me, Mayor Pratham Garner. Oh, I'm, I mean, I, I stand the same as that I think we should, I understand that it's a larger issue overall, but I think there's a very specific issue that we've been discussing for a long time regarding the base level that I actually haven't heard opposite in regards of base level. Um, that's why I brought it up as something that can be addressed <clears throat> rather than going into the, all of the other things. And I do think if I, I'm sorry, if I could, I think that, that though, I think that complaint comes out of special events happening at things of which we give a permit for. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it can, it can be through the city manager's office and through and that can be addressed um, um, during the permitting process. I don't, I don't want to belabor the issue. Uh, the majority has spoken and uh, it's time to, to move on. Uh, and I, I know we'll all be hearing and saying more on this subject uh, as we move forward. Okay, if it's okay, I'll share my screen and we'll keep going. Um, and, and mayor and council, you let me know how long we need to go. Uh, there's little doubt in my mind we won't wrap this up tonight, but um, I'm happy to continue to make some progress if we can. Okay, let's see. Hopefully I can still advance. Yes, great. The next priority area that uh, we've drafted from the, these visioning conversations was uh, environmental stewardship. So. 
Um, we've got a handful of things here, accelerate climate action plan, uh, consider new policies, develop internal policies and practices. You know, this is a bit, it, it might appear sparse. Again, you kind of have to, um, when the work plans come, you'll really see the weight of things. Saying it will accelerate the climate action plan is a behemoth because that's a big plan and, and it contemplates doing lots and lots of things. Um, so we've initially targeted things like budget for some additional FTE. Right now we have one because we're in transition with the, the leader of that uh, department and that program. Um, we wanna complete the greenhouse gas analysis because that helps us establish some of the priorities within the climate action plan and then target some of those high value projects and initiatives. What we'll see when we look at these work plans, especially in a situation like this where now we have one person and we probably wanna grow the department some. I mean, I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. That transition is gonna be six to 12 months. It just is. When you lose one person in a department of 10, it's it's a little easier. When you lose 50% and you lose the leadership of a department, some uh, mention was made earlier to parks and recreation. Part of our challenge with that position, which can happen here with sustainability, is um, we didn't get our first or second or third candidate with parks and recreation. So that search continues. And sometimes it works that way, especially in, in tight labor markets. So um, it's not going to be easy or quick, but we know that this one is important. And as we grow that department, we'll be able to accelerate progress. We do want to consider this as new policies. Some of these are, are implementing new policies, right? Like 1383, we've talked a little bit about Desert Community Energy and the good work that entity is doing, but there's still some work to solidify exactly how uh, that, that entity moves forward. Um, commercial renewable energy standards is a conversation we're having currently. Community composting has been introduced and then clarify some of our land conservation goals, which was another thing we discussed at, at those visioning sessions. And then lastly, develop internal policies and practices because our uh, sustainability program has frankly been oriented out into the community, which is good, but we do need to catch up with integrating sustainability with our other departments. So this means things like low impact development, um, it means uh, even, um, you know, using post-consumer recycled materials at work and, and other things that will help us be green as an organization, including things like the, the green purchasing policies. So there's a lot more here because, again, we can expand climate action plan into a lot of things. Um, progress is going to be a little bit slower. I expect over the next six or 12 months, we're going to keep things going with foodware, with 1383 and a couple of things on this list, but our hands will be a little bit tied as we try to staff up again. So I can leave this on for a minute um, and then I can stop sharing if there's significant deliberations, but have we got this more or less right? I'm seeing at least some nodding heads. I don't have everyone on screen, so I'm scanning through. It looks like we're good. So I'm going to move on if that's okay. Great. So next, um, we have, I'm sorry, but my, my, my ribbon is in the way of my heading. I believe this is the community infrastructure category. Um, so consistent with that theme of back to basics, we want to look at our city facilities. We want to increase our maintenance budget. I think our tourist economy has really taken off and we haven't quite caught up. And, um, you know, we get calls and requests for, you know, pickleball courts and dog parks and street lights. And, you know, I want to pause for a second because I know I was quoted in, in one of our uh, very good news sources as saying uh, something about not changing every street light. Um, what I was trying to communicate there was what I'm trying to communicate here, which is that there's a lot to do. And if all we do is drop everything every time a street light goes out, we miss the opportunity to grow the department that handles the street lights so that they can get to it right away every single time, right? So, so that's what I meant to convey. These priorities certainly reflect that we want to be able to change street lights right away. We want to be able to keep up with landscape maintenance. And it's going to take growing our department a little bit to get better at responding to those issues and raise the standard a little bit. Uh, also, prioritizing deferred maintenance, same thing. Uh, we've got a five-year capital improvements plan that will come back as part of this next budget process. We heard a lot from council about um, walking and biking infrastructure, um, identifying some of the high priority facilities. Some of those are big projects that we've talked about for a little while, like libraries. Um, some of them are just high level needs like fire stations. 
Uh, but we also want to look at our parks and our community facilities. Um, a council member mentioned earlier that, you know, there, there's a lot of effort we could put into some of those existing assets to make them higher quality. And that's another example where it ties directly to quality of life, but it's here in the community infrastructure category. And then under community design, long term, some of these we will not get to within 12 months. But again, they reflected some of the priority conversation. The general plan update, probably realistic. But as we start to look at an old zoning code and, and updating that and some of the design standards, we might be able to tackle some component pieces. But we would probably probably not even start both of those in earnest, the zoning code especially, and within 12 months. But, but we can start preparing for it and, and plan that work over the couple of years um, after that. Uh, this is meant to reflect it being important within this category of community design, um, something that uh, Council Member Woods um, often referred to as urban form, right? A lot of those things are, are captured in our zoning code and our design standards. Any comments here? Uh one comment I'll make uh, when it comes to community design and that sort of work is uh, we need to also be far, far more efficient. And perhaps this comes under good governance at uh, how promptly we move uh, plans through the planning process. Uh, and that time issue is, uh, is an enormous one when it comes to uh, infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. And we will see that in the good governance section. Um, and, and, and that's another good example of where some of these categories overlap. We've decided to put certain things in certain places, um, but that's a good example of facilitating some of the community design, but through improved service levels. Anything else? I just, can I make a comment? Um, I'm not necessarily asking for this to come on here. Um, I know we talked about it at the visioning session, but I just want to flag upon reflection. Um, I really think internet infrastructure to support the work from home economy and the people who are moving here to work, um, I think that's urgent. I think people actually are moving here and, you know, we can debate about that because that's probably also why homes are over a million dollars because people in big tech are able to move here and work here, but they're actually not able to work here because there's not good enough internet and cell service. And so I just, on reflection, I just want to make sure I say out loud, um, I think that's really urgent. I think we're going to lose those folks who aren't going to actually be able to, I just got an email today that they are this week that um, they're trying to move here more full time, but they really just can't sustain their jobs because of the lack of cell service and internet. So I know that's on our list is like tracking um, for quality of life, monitor broadband opportunities. But um, yeah, I know we talked about the timeline of that, but I just had to say out loud, I think it's really urgent. Agree. Okay, if we're ready, we'll keep going. Last category is good governance. So we have categories or subcategories, including enhanced service levels, improved communications, remove barriers to participation, which goes back to some of the uh, some working groups of suggestions that were made. I, I think maybe back in 19 or um, anyway, it was, it was well before my time. And then improve financial management. That's always a goal. Um, but when you look at the sub-level tasks here and in, in enhancing service levels is evaluating and adjusting uh, staffing levels. So we called out maintenance specifically in the last category because of some of the work that needs to be done with our facilities and infrastructure. But it's just as important to look at our processing time for plans and building permits and those kinds of things. Um, so our staff right now are, are looking at that. And you should expect to see some budget requests uh, from various departments looking to improve those service levels. We want to create some training programs internally, um, focus a little more on, on uh, staff and team development, implement some employee engagement opportunities, and we need to update our HR policies eventually. I, I understand that these aren't as outward facing as some of the other priorities, but they're important. Um, excellent services, programs, projects are produced from excellent teams, and so we want to continually invest in ours. 
Um, one of those that is more outward facing is the communications team. Um, ours is frankly just too small for an organization our size, even in a normal community where people are not as engaged in one like ours where people are very engaged, we, we just need more help. I think council recognizes that. Um, and in particular there, we also want to continue to improve our Spanish language communications, which has been a good um, shift for us, but, but we're not all the way there yet. Uh, I mentioned remove barriers to participation. The kinds of these are somewhat smaller in part because again, the, the scale of our priorities is significant, but we wanted to examine um, council salaries, noting that that is a barrier to participation for, for many people. Um, visit a, a car allowance in part to you know, expedite and make things more efficient with some of the travel that you all need to do. And then addressing childcare needs, which is not just for council, but could be something that we look at more broadly as a component of participation. Then lastly, with improving financial management, um, I, boy, I'd like to, I could have a very big list here, but at least a couple of things we'd like to do in the near horizon is clarify and review some of our budget process. We're doing that now, and we want to create an asset management program. That's really what we were talking about with street paving is an asset management program. How do we manage that asset in a way that's sustainable? We need to do the same thing with all of our facilities, our parks, our major pieces of equipment. Um, and so that's a good, good component to start with. We've done some, but a lot more we can do uh, with that in our budget. Any comments on this section? This is really well put together. Okay. Thank you, We're picking up some speed. Just want to clarify that next steps, um, we've had a couple changes, but not many. Um, certainly, as we do work planning, I, I should have mentioned, really, this is iterative. This is meant to capture the big things. It doesn't mean we're not going to do any other work, and it doesn't mean we won't sit down in a few months and decide, you know what, we've got we've to adjust the list a little bit. That's all fair and reasonable, but this helps us keep our bearings and helps keep us honest in the way we program our work. So we'll incorporate some changes. The work plans will be created. They're in process now. Um, I mentioned that I'd like to track and review that progress regularly. So if we do something like add a study session every third or fourth, I would suggest we're pulling out these work plans and these strategic goals and basically looking at where we've been, where we're at, and where we're going, again, to keep that bearing um, really focused on these highest priorities. Council Member Holstich. Thank you. Really appreciate this. I just want to clarify for the public um, that this, and Justin, maybe you can do that, is a draft plan. So it's not like we went into closed session um, and you know gave strategic direction to the city manager and this is what we're going to do, it, right? It's that we want to hear from the community. That's why we're publicizing this now. That's the point of this. Um, and that, you know, obviously will continue to involve the public um, in the next steps of that process and of having a public work plan. So the, really, I just want to invite the public to give us this feedback. This is, we hear from you every day. You know, we get hundreds of emails a week. This is what we think the city's priorities are, but we very much want that feedback and want to have these conversations openly and honestly um, as a group in public. Absolutely. Um, it should be noted that these priorities do also come from the residents, both by way of the representatives, which are you, and the community survey and the myriad stakeholder groups and, you know, the commissions and other work that really culminates in this conversation. But even then, it is still a draft document. Um, it's a living document, if you will. And, and people should, um, they are encouraged to continue to comment both on what's right, what's wrong, what else they'd like to see. Uh, Justin, could we go back to gallery view so that we can see each other? I, uh, of course. Thank you. All right. Uh, council member, of course. Nice to see everyone. Um, no, thank you. That was really helpful. And I think um, you know, highlighting that on the website, sort of once you make the, any changes to it, so the public has some more time with it, I think would be really important. And just, um, you know, there are some things on that list, like, increase our communications department uh, that I think were in our top three strategic priorities in 2016, my first year on council. So, um, and it's just a reminder for us and for the public, I mean, that list, turning that into a work plan and thinking we can do a f half of that in 12 months or 18 months is, you know, just the reality of this, right? So 
Um, all of it's important. Um, there are a lot of things that aren't on that list that have been on our long standing list that, you know, where public is not going to see, then there are some strong advocates for many of those things. Um, and to make sure nothing's fallen off, it's just if we're really going to tackle our most urgent priorities, like we're in a housing crisis, we're in a homeless crisis, um, you know, ultimately you need to think how much staff time you have on it's really doable when you present a work plan right. with some options for us. And then how much time is realistic? Given the amount of council time we have, even if we add a study session, you know, study sessions, um, what can get done? Um, and, you know, I went to the earlier discussion, you know, a lot happened in subcommittees before, but there are downsides to that. And so, but having working groups where you can bring, you know, not just stakeholders, but folks who may not, you know, have a strong feeling on either side, because that's typically who we hear from, um, together to work on some of these things, and we have engaged residents who want to do that, will help, I think, a process. Um, it will take some staff time, but I think maybe less than the current system we've been using. And that, that's one of the hopes here, right, is we come up with a process that really engages more people. Because, uh, you know, we always we often vote on things that there have been all kinds of meetings and people call in and like, you know, we didn't get to weigh in, right? You know, and so how we how we do that um, is going to be important. And I know we've talked about working groups or other ways to try and engage more of our residents, including residents who normally don't engage, because we don't only want to hear from the two sides. Right. There are a lot of people who don't have strong feelings who could really share valuable insight that may be really more um, representative of the majority of our residents and businesses. Yeah, and, and a lot of that is in this, the second half of this um, presentation and staff report concerning process. Get, given the timing, um, I, I check with council to see if we're better to break now or if we want to push through with some of that um, component of the conversation. And this is indicative of where we end up, right? It's next agenda is already full, um, but if we don't finish this item, it's going to take up space on the next agenda. And we do talk about having five hours twice a month, 10 hours a month, but but really, an hour, an hour and a half of that is some of the more ceremonial things and presentations, and they're all important, but none of those are the priority work. So 20% of the time, at minimum, right off the bat, is gone, right? 20% of your time convening is for those presentations and, and the other components of, of the beginnings of our meetings. That's one of the things we'll talk about is making those more efficient, but I couldn't emphasize enough how limited that time can be. Um, and how much work there is to do. Council member Woods. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. I, I think one of the things we um, set as a priority and it came out, but I was just gonna ask you for a little further clarification. It's under good governance and communications. Uh, we're very fortunate in the city to have so many people that volunteer their time and their expertise on our boards and commissions. And I, I think there, there's been a little frustration about a disconnect between council and some of those. And can you just talk to that a little bit about what our goals are for that in the next year? So I do have that as a, as a section of the process. Would you like me to jump ahead to that section now and, and we can tackle that one this evening? I mean, I'm fine going forward, but I worry we have not that many members of the public at this hour. And I think, we want them to hear this, right? I mean, this whole item almost should be a study session, right? This is- It, it sure could be. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, but I, you know, doing things at this hour and we've heard complaints of it, people feel, you know, I turned off and what happened? Um, and this is something I think we all need to be really at our best and have the public hear it. So, but if people want to go forward, I'm wide awake. I had a lot of coffee. Mayor Pro Tim Garner. Um, yeah, I think there are, I would rather do it a little bit more fresh. Um, I'm also having trouble keeping my <laughs> my cats away from me right now, so <laughs> I'm good to break. I think we have given the public an incredible amount of really good information, and uh, it might be wise to uh, let this get absorbed before we start expanding it beyond. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add is, uh, uh, implicit in all of these goals that we've talked about is trying to be far more efficient uh, when we get together uh, and uh, 
uh, to make the uh, midnight closures uh, in talking about our most critical issues uh, at 10.30 and 11 o'clock at uh, night becomes uh, something in the past. Uh, and that's gonna re require a lot of work on the part of all of us uh, in how we structure our meetings and how long we talk through uh, some issues. Uh, Council Member Holstridge. Thank you, I agree. Thank you for saying that. And I tried to be on my best behavior today, <laughs> really only vote and say, you know, not repeat, but I'll just echo my request that when we talk about efficiency, I think we should put new business first because we have every single meeting, the most important thing at the very end. And we know that we will take up the time that we're given. And so frankly, we had some important items tonight, but we talked a lot more than we would have if they those items that didn't necessarily necessarily need to be so in depth with so much brain power than this one, right? Um, if we had those later on in the meeting. So I'll just keep asking that we consider how we arrange it in a way that we can use our brains and the public for this, because the public cares about this. Um, and that would have been good to do first. So, so, so mayor and council, um, those are some of the notes that we were going to discuss tonight, but I understand that it's late. So how about if I ask, can we get direction from council to do two things? One is start to schedule a study session, um, ideally monthly. And the first one of those could be to finish this conversation. And two, there are a number of uh, council meeting efficiency things we talked about, rearranging the agenda and some other things that instead of bringing back just as discussion, we could bring back to you as decisions to make, amendments to your rules of procedure consistent with the conversations we've had. If we can do those two things, I think next time we come back, we'll have some substance. Great. Great. And then I will make the PowerPoint available because it does have some details that go beyond the staff report so people can start to anticipate some of the process improvement, uh, improvement conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, have we concluded this item? Yes, Mayor. Okay. And this was a report, so there's no uh, action that's required in terms of taking a vote, if I'm correct, Mr. Mejia. You are correct. All right, then we move on to what truly should be the last item that we have. City Council and City Manager requests an upcoming agenda development. This time is set aside for the City Council to make requests of staff and or issues of concern to council members are briefly, pre briefly presented. Did I say that correctly? Prioritized and then set for future meeting dates. Mayor, I'll mention just that we do have a full agenda for the 27th. I'm happy to share the screen and, and have you look at it if you'd like. But um, I got what I needed in terms of um, working on scheduling those study sessions. Um, and, and again, our, our agenda is full the 27th. We'll have to move some things around probably already to make that a little more reasonable. So if you want to look at it, I can show you. Um, otherwise, um, we have plenty of work. Would you like to see it? I see a few nodding heads. So if you don't mind, Mayor, I'll put it up. Right ahead. So if you can see the screen here on the 27th, this is what we're looking at. Um, we had been building our schedule with about five hours of business that sometimes was taking us till closer to midnight opposed to closer to 10. And then sometimes actually significant items like climate action plan were being deferred. So we are now trying to work that closer to four hours. So this is already a little heavy. Um, some items may need to be deferred anyway. Um, but if you have comments on things that you think um, we need to discuss or that can wait, we can certainly take those notes. Uh, I can't see everyone right now. So I do see council member Kors. Uh, um, sure. Um, so at, at the last, I think September, um, maybe the business uh, retention economic development, we did talk about, um, I don't know if this is what this 30 minutes in, some minor changes to 
the TOT um, incentive for hotels that do renovations that we already have in place, although we haven't really promoted, um, dealing with, you know, sort of local hire, some of those things. Um, and I think the next piece was just, um, and I don't know if it even got to uh, the city attorney or not, but I think what um, council member Holstage and I, and the folks who are there, um, from the hotels and the building trades were, you know, to see what that language would be and maybe, you know, have the city attorney or staff have a meeting with those two groups um, on language, which I think was not very, I mean, the two things were making some lo a local hire requirements similar to some of what's in the community workforce agreement, um, not to the extent, um, but something similar to that for major um, TOT renovation renovations and, um, publicizing it and make sure all the hotels know that they have this available program because so many of the hotels don't know, especially the ones who aren't, you know, the big hotels who are, you know, on all the group calls. So I don't even know that we, what the discussion would be if that's what it is. I think that's just a staff meeting with a couple of stakeholders. What, what's contemplated in that agenda item, I believe, is actually a specific request for a TOT incentive, and it may or may not be ready for this next meeting. Oh, from one hotel. and Yeah. Okay. So the other issue still is out there from September. So right. we can talk to you about that separately, but I don't think that needs, that would only come to council. I think it's might, might be minor enough to be a consent item. It doesn't need a discussion. I don't okay. Think. Okay. And I can put the list back up if anyone wants to see it. I, I, I just want to make sure. Trying to take things yeah. off. <laughs> council member hostage. Yeah, if you could pull up the list again, please. You bet. So can you remind us? So yeah, and for the public, it might actually it might be helpful for us and the public to explain what these are. So for the discussion of COVID orders. So can you Yep, this is directed by council. So you had an opportunity in December to consider reducing some of um you know the, the restrictions. Of course, we've had a surge. Um, since then, but you had directed staff to bring it back on the 27th. That's an item we could defer if you think that's probably uh, premature. Uh, things have been changing quickly, but perhaps not that quickly. I know. I think we did a date certain, but I would support um, not considering that at January 27th, not pushing it out too long because of the commitment we made to businesses. But I can't imagine anyone is advocating that we reduce protections right. during the height of the search. We could just tentatively push at one meeting for now and, and see where we're at when we review this on the 27th, if that's acceptable to council. Is there any question that we may have to increase the uh, level of uh, restriction that we have uh, as a result of uh, uh, this the uh, incredible uptick that we've had in COVID. Just a suggestion, which would be we take it off for two weeks and if things are such that the numbers should go up enough that we need to, you know, it looks like there are new restrictions we need or go down to the point where we think we can reduce them. You know, city managers, our emergency director, um, we can always have a quick, you know, session on it emergency session that you can call or closed session to talk about something to make things happen quick if we need to act. But I think when you think about the public comment that we get on that and the amount of time we take when things seem to be sort of level right now, at least from the report we got today, if it... Um, I could certainly take the approach that if it remains level or slightly improving, but not dramatically, that we probably need to wait another couple of weeks. If things worsen, we probably need to have a conversation. I could take that approach. Okay. And, and then I did be, if that's okay. I also got clarification that the TOT incentive item likely won't be ready for the 27th. So that one will probably get pushed as well. That works for me. Okay. Should, should I put this back up one more time or do we feel good? Yeah, I'll put it up one more time. Just okay. To... Okay. <laughs> Happy to. So just just a question out of curiosity, um, the MOU with Plaza Theater fundraising. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, is that need to happen before this uh, concert that, that we're having there? Or I'm just curious how that, how the timing of that comes about. No, I don't think it does. Um, it's just something that we've been working on and it's, it's probably ready. I think that group has been meeting and doing some things and, and it would be good for us to solidify the relationship with this newly created um, entity. Um, I think that's why it's on here. Okay. And I believe that those concerts are being moved, I think, to May. Yeah, they, they, they very well the may. Uh, uh, maybe on, in May. I heard that on Pisha today. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've heard that too. But but I think the other components of, you know, um, fundraising and preparing for everything we'd like to do there continue. And again, a lot of that's captured in this MOU that defines relationships differently than they were uh, previously. Um, the SB9 ordinance, right? We did the urgency and we said we wanted more time before a permanent comes back. Yeah, so I think this would just be a second read, right? Or is is that uh, there's there's no second reading on it? Right, it's order. urgency. Yeah, it's urgency. Okay. So okay, so that so probably that, can come off. I think that right? can come off too. Then mm -hmm. yeah, we have nothing. We're good. But we 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 likely will. All, we almost always oh. have a few things that we need to add to. And Flynn, I see Flynn's hand up. By the way, on that. <laughs> We do need to have a public hearing on the SB9 ordinance. While we adopted the urgency ordinance this evening, we need to come back with the regular ordinance. Okay. Are we to the point of uh, being able to adjourn? I think I see heads shaking. Yes. Now. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yes, well, please. It's not yet the witching hour, but we are going to adjourn. Uh, the next uh, regular city council meeting will be held on January 27th, 2022 at 530 p.m. Please, everyone, be safe out there. Good night. Good night.